So good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here for uh, this uh, specific workshop on the analysis. We welcome also our keynote speakers who are who is are with us. So we start uh, this morning session by inviting Professor Elias Sombrasi, the dean of the School of Philosophy, and she is uh, directly connected to the Thinking Boys, as she is a changer in Byzantine music. So I think that he will tell us more about that. Welcome. Thank you. Good morning, dear colleagues, dear colleagues, distinguished guests. We are as the of the Department of Studies of the School of Philosophy of the National Federation University of Athens. It's my pleasure and a great honor to having um, such an opportunity today to salute this so interesting international workshop of artistic analysis and synthesis of the singing world, scientific overview and argument tools in vocal capacity. The singing vocal quality, the vocal track during singing, as well as the assistance in singing through visual feed and the neural network are musicological themes crucial important. Singing voice research on vocal pedagogy is a thousand based on the acoustic of the singing voice, the vocal physiology modeling, the singing performance analysis and the music information retrieval. This project, the so-called ASMA project, means assistance for students in singing and music aspects is a national research project of vocal instruction and direction in the digital classroom that brings together experts, researchers, and performers of singing voice, acoustics, and uh, technology. The present speaker is exclusively interested about the issue as a vocal performer of visiting music, as my friend and colleague has already mentioned. It has to be noted that visiting music Visiting music specific sound is being described as a similar one to the voice of the soft breathing. Please allow me to share what is characteristically written to a well known Old Testament scene. Lias, the prophet, witnessed the divine epiphany, not even violent wind nor in the earthquake and the fire, but in the voice of the soft breeze. And the voice of the soft breeze is the voice of my team, the voice of the good. This is the reason why the melodies say that let's us stand for the sake of my team. And that is why in the church, we must sound with wild voices, with the voice of the soft breeze, and not with loud and discordant voices similar to the violent wind and the earthquake to which God did not reveal himself. So, the present speaker is always trying to approach such a sound through the voice. And that's why we are so very much looking forward to studying the results of this innovative project of the research on the social and aesthetics importance of the voc vocal training and the function of the singing voice. Dear colleagues, I would like to take this opportunity and um, congratulate all stakeholders uh, involved in this um, so interesting academic event and project and uh, wholeheartedly wish a great success to the works of this uh, symposium. So good morning, everybody. As uh, the head of the music department and the organizer of this uh, uh, scientific workshop, I would like, first of all, to thank the special invited uh, speakers that they have accepted our invitation, even the last moment. And uh, I will name them after. And uh, of course, my colleagues 
and uh, PhD students that help to organize this special event. That uh, most of them come from uh, the ASMA project, and uh, they were there to for two three years to assist to this uh, difficult uh, project because it was happening during the COVID, and we didn't have the means to do all the activities we wanted because we didn't have access uh, to the students and thinking uh, uh, services and things like that. So first of all, I would like to say that uh, the voice in all dimensions and manifestation was, is, and will be the main way of communication of people for the expression of speech and emotion. And I say that because uh, we live in the fourth uh, digital revolution, so it's very hard to see what will happen in the future with the AI uh, speaking voice and thinking voice. So we hope that uh, voice will be always the self-expression of the human being. The voice that sounds signal and as an expression in singing is directly connected to the human culture and has deep roots in primitive cultures as it precedes the development of the speaking voice. And I say that because also we see that we lose many cultures and it's very important to see in which way we are going to preserve the cultural heritage of the speaking voice of lost cultures. In the last 50 years, the science of the speaking voice has been continuously developed through an interdisciplinary approach, including the science of music acoustics, performance studies, medicine, linguistics, phonology, musicology, as well as neuroscience and informatics. In order to investigate the singing vocal, vocal qualities, to model the function of the vocal tract during singing, and to assist singing through visual feedback and neural networks. The last researches include investigation also in different singing styles. We have the professor Johann Sundberg and Malte Krob who have done a lot of researches. What is a singing style? And how someone is imitating the singing style of the other? And this is the problem. We can see this in all these TV emissions, the voice. Many imitations of singing style. So you lose yourself. And uh, till now, there have been a lot of research on the singing style in the opera, in pop and rock music, <clears throat> in jazz, in contemporary music, but also the most important is uh, the research in the vocal traditions that are starting to get lost. Vocal tradition from the Diphonic song in Mongolia, vocal tradition of the Pygmeo Aka in uh, Central Africa, vocal tradition in the South Europe. There are a lot of vocal singing traditions. From the seed of the Aristotelian approach to the phenomenon of the voice, you know that Aristotle in his problems is putting the question on the function of the singing voice and especially on the variety of the voice, the relationship between hearing and thinking, the relation between nasality of a deep, the internal temperature and vocal intensity, the external temperature and frequency, the vocal quality during seasons, the relation between the age and the vocal quality, the relation between emotions and the quality. So if we reread, the problems of Aristotle, we are going to find a lot of questions about the physiology of the voice. And uh, from the seed of the Aristotelian approach and the Aristoxenian also approach, which is a more musicological and not physiological approach, Aristoxenos is speaking about the changes of the vocal signal through the theory of the Logodes melody which is very important, through the centuries, through Boethius, Boes, and through many other important writers <clears throat> of uh, the music science, Mersenne, 
and uh, helm holds in the beginning of the 20th century. We come in our days to the science of the singing voice, and we're very, very happy to have with us the main founder of the science of the singing voice, Professor Johann Sundberg, who is here with us, and he is professor in doctorate honoris of the University of Athens. He has been nominated in 2014. So we're very happy that the science of the singing voice it has been founded 40 years ago by Johann Schoenberg. And uh, we know that the roots of this science of the singing voice come from the science of the speaking voice. And now we have innovative tools and methodologies. And another way for the aesthetic approach and the musicological analysis of the singing voice phenomenon which leads to a scientific approach to the pedagogy and interpretation of the voice through the understanding of the acoustic function of the vocal organ and the cognitive mechanism that govern it. So this project that we wanted to create is a project that takes a feedback from all these new scientific approaches on the acoustic function of the speaking, uh, of the singing voice, the cognitive approaches, the aesthetic approaches. And we would like to give all this scientific data by a different way to the children in order to have an awareness of their singing voice. <clears throat> and it's important to teach children to sing in our days, because children are very confused with all these digital tools, social networks, and uh, they must have a way to self-express. I think that singing and dance, there are two direct activities that they must happen in school almost every day, because it's a way of self-expression. So, in our laboratory of music acoustics and technology that belongs at the music department, we use new techniques and technologies for the systematic study of the singing voice and especially techniques that support the Greek language in singing uh, and in traditional singing, in Byzantine singing, but also in singing uh, the opera in the Greek language. So we do, uh, a lot of research on the phonology of the Greek language in singing. Uh, we have five PhD students that are uh, doing their research on the acoustics of the singing voice, but also developing new tools and technologies for the education, but also for the pedagogy of opera singers. And just to finish, I would like to tell you that this workshop aims, firstly, to communicate the results of the ASMA, Assistance for Students in Thinking in Music Aesthetics. This is our project, which is supported uh, by ELIVEC, it's a national research project on vocal instruction and interaction in the digital classroom. But also, it was uh, an opportunity to invite the experts, scientists, in the singing voice area and uh, listen what do they have to say us, not only about the analysis of the singing voice, but also the synthesis and <clears throat> the machine learning techniques that we have at the Internet of Things. And I think that in the future, assistance in singing will happen also by AI and machine learning because they, we will have cases that the internet will propose you different thinking styles which fit to your personality. So we have the honor to have with us Professor Johann Sundberg from the KTH uh, from Sweden. He is, as I told you, specialist 
through the anatomy, physiology of the singing voice, acoustics, voice cognition and perception. And um, I am very honored because he was my mentor during my PhD studies at IRCAM. And he has helped me a lot during my PhD. Thank you very much, Johan. And um, we're very lucky because Johan is uh, the mentor of all of us in the area of singing. So we meet him very often in conferences all over Europe, all over the world. And uh, congratulations, Johan, that you are there for us, <laughs> really. So we have also the honor to have with us Professor Claudio Manfredi, who is specialist in the biometrics of the singing voice at the School of Electrical Engineering at the University of Firenze. So we will have another approach uh, for the modeling of the singing voice. And she's organizing every year the Madeba conference, uh, every two years, maybe, yes, yes, which is on the modeling of the singing voice in Firenze. We have also Professor uh, uh, Maltekob, who is uh, at the University of Music and Performing Arts in Vienna. And he is a specialist uh, in the modeling also of the singing voice and the acoustics of the singing voice because he's also a musician and uh, has written a lot of articles about the analysis of the singing voice times, which is very important to see what happens in our day when we sing. It's our voice or we imitate the singing style of the other. What happened? So thank you very much also Malte to be with us. We have also the head of the research team at IRCAM, team of analysis synthesis of the voice at IRCAM in Paris, Dr. Axel Rebel, who is a specialist in uh, machine learning techniques and signal processing of the voice. So he will tell us about the new directions of the algorithms, algorithmic approach of the singing voice. As also tomorrow we will have uh, uh, Dr. Vasilis Katsouros, who is the head of a research institute here in Athens, and he will speak about all these directions of the machine learning in the voice. And we will have online uh, two very prominent uh, professors, Professor Graham Welch from the UCL in the uh, uh, UK, University uh, Institute of Music Education, he has done already a research, as we are doing now, on the training of students by visual feedback. Uh, we have created our, our own tools in Greek language. So he's going to speak to us about his experience of this uh, project in UK um, at uh, 2010. Uh, we have also the honor to have uh, online Professor Heinrich Nathalie who is a specialist uh, also at the acoustics of the singing voice. And um, <clears throat> of course, tomorrow we're going to have uh, the approach from the side of the medicine, because it's very important when we speak about the singing voice to see how <clears throat> we, we can treat uh, the therapy of the voice. So Professor Thanos Gibas is the only one in Greece that has a very good team on the uh, evidence-based medicine in the care of the singing voice. And he will speak to us about uh, his results. Uh, so I would like to thank also very much uh, the PhD student Evangelos uh, Angelakis and uh, the PhD student George Medusis because they have worked a lot for this workshop, but also Kostas Katsadonis, who is uh, making the su technical support. Sofia Stavropoulou, who is a postdoc <laughs> researcher. Areti Andreopoulou, who is assistant professor. <clears throat> and also, um, who else? I forgot someone else. Uh, and Jacob Steinhauer, who is an assistant professor in music aesthetics. So we try to see in which way we can find the connection between aesthetics and computation. And we speak about computational aesthetics, as Johan has already introduced in his articles about the ugliness of the voice. 
So welcome all of you. I hope that you are going to find uh, this uh, workshop very fruitful. And um, we are very happy that we have in our audience many uh, vocal uh, instructors and singers. Thank you very much. And um, here we are. Thank you. Now I would like to invite the professor, the professor, <laughs> Johan Sundberg, that first of all, he's not a professor, he's an uh, anthropos, we must say that. Anthropos with A, because the first who has spoken about anthropos was Edith when he has uh, stroke the Sphinx, and he said, Anthropos. First of all, you must be anthropos and doctor scientist. So we have the honor to have the anthropos, Professor Johann Strunberg. Thank you very much. It is fantastic. Uh, pleasure to be here and to see the activity in the report of the on the singing voice, uh, and I will let uh, uh, of the uh, voice function, uh, three parts of the voice, the uh, one is the resonator and one is the other one is the vibrations of the vocal code. Maybe I should Yeah, oh, okay. But let's move it a bit here so that I'll... Yeah. And why is singing voice important? That is because singers are very good uh, subjects because when you tell them to do one thing, they do it. And if you tell them to do the same thing once more, they do that also. And they don't change between repeats. And that is a blessing when you try to understand the functional things. So I would uh, concentrate on the glossal action, the, uh, the vibration of the vocal code. And um, uh, my menu uh, that I'm going to serve is uh, uh, on what the voice source is and what the breathing behavior could add to the voice source and uh, what the vocal track and the note can add to the voice source. Yeah. Almost. There we go. Yep. Uh, right on. Yes, voices. Yep. So um, um, this was the menu that I would like to talk about: the voice source, the control, and the effect on the voice timbre, the breathing behavior, and the its control, and the effect that it should have on the voice vocal tone function and the vocal tract on the nose and the effect on the voice sound. Okay, so this is the, uh, the function of the voice in, in a nutshell. We have a pulsating glossal airflow, and that is called the voice source. It's the sound, and uh, um, this sound is injected into the vocal tract, and that is controlled by the tape of the vocal tract, and that is called articulation, and that contributes seriously to the, um, oh, thank you. Um, to the um, um, spectrum of the sound. Now the voice source. Uh, let's look at it first. And uh, this is how it uh, looks. Uh, you could see the, um, uh, the vocal tone here, and you could see the arytenoids that uh, see the uh, posterior part of the vocal tone. And that here you could see a little deep part of the epiglottis also and the ventricular folks are the red ones that are the big. Here is the high-speed um, movie of how it works, and that gives a good idea of the quality, the mechanical quality of the phone. You see that they are quite relaxed, and, uh, um, and that is, they open and close the glosses in a quasi periodic fashion. Okay, uh, so, um, Vocal code vibration produce, of course, a simmering glossal uh, airflow, 
and that is the raw material of voice sound. And actually, uh, my voice, if I didn't have my head um, on the top of the glosses, uh, my voice would be sound. My microphone uh, is now off, yeah, but I can't move the mic, the um, mouse is on. Do I have a, a double screen uh, here? Yeah, this one. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> Sorry for that. The disturbance. Um, yes, this is it. Uh, and uh, mm, was it? And then uh, the obvious result of the vibrating airflow with a uh, lung pressure below it is the pulsating airflow, uh, and the voice source sounds like that. And if you make a uh, picture, a uh, waveform of the glottal airflow versus time, you could see that there is an, uh, that there are liters per second streaming through the um, glottis when the vocal cords are open. So you get an increasing airflow and then it decreases at the back at the glottis basis again, and then you return to the closed phase. Now, the marvel of this is that it is, uh, this is a complex signal with a lot of um, parcels, uh, fundamental, the second, third, fourth, and twenty parcels, and you have the musical intervals between the lowest spectrum parcels in musical sound. Three voice control uh, parameters. You control mainly the voice source, you control it mainly by three parameters, and they are in interesting and important. So here we have the voice source with its spectrum and its waveform. And one uh, thing that you could continuously vary in the voice source is the vocal fold length and tension, and that controls the pitch. And then you also have the sub vocal pressure, the lung pressure, and that controls the loudness, and then the glottal adduction that um, controls the type of voice that you're producing. And I will talk about each of these uh, in uh, sequence. Okay, and they. They then travel through the vocal tract resonances with the frequency curve looking like this. Okay, 
So voice control parameter number one is the um, uh, length and thickness of the vocal cords, and that controls the pitch, that is the fundamental frequency. Um, the guys that control the length and the uh, stiffness of the codes that are muscles, of course, and the one goes uh, from the thyroid cartilage down to the cricoid and move the cartilage and tilt the, the cricoid cartilage also, so that the, um, the cartilage that hold the posterior part and all the vocal codes, they sort of do this when you uh, increase. And you can see, you just put your finger. Uh, uh, between the thyroid and the um, thyroid, and uh, you can see, uh, ooh, ooh, here you can see that the distance between these two possibilities is uh, varying. Okay, so uh, this is how it looks. Uh, my friend Ron Fehrer sent me this, and maybe we could uh, go to the uh, fiber optic view of it. He is now uh, showing his glosses from above. Um, okay, so you see, uh, so you see uh, quite uh, clearly that the sort of um, field backwards and stretch the pose and then it goes up. Okay, I would like to uh, call your attention to this. Um, uh, interesting um, analysis uh, from the 1990s by Schick, um, where he was measuring the uh, um, pitch, no, the fundamental frequency variations of the vibrato tone, and then also the EMG, the electromyographic signal from the pitch raising sub uh, muscle, which is the cricothyroid muscle, and you could see that it start to fire uh, when the pitch is sinking down. Uh, uh, so, and there's a nice synchronicity between the onset of the activity of the cricoid uh, when the pitch is sliding down and then uh, it pulls the pitch up again and then it releases and then the pitch is sinking down again. So you have a sort of physiological um, uh, equivalent or producer of the vibration. Okay, uh, voice control parameter uh, number two uh, is not the vocal code uh, length and thickness, but the subglossal pressure. Subglossal pressure is the air pressure that you have in the lungs, and we establish it by squeezing the, the, the uh, respiratory apparatus. Um, so um, we could have some data, perhaps, of what happens when you change the subglossal pressure with the voice code. So when we have a very soft um, uh, voice, uh, very low pressure, we have a, a low, uh, small um, local airflow, sinusoidal. And when we go to soft, uh, and when we go to loud, and when we go to very loud, you see that the steepness of the closing part of the local airflow is increasing. The steepness is increasing. And that is the origin of the decibel. That is the origin of, of the uh, acoustical loudness that you get. The rest of the um, waveform is not very um, important, except for one thing. But I won't tell you until a little later what that is. OK, and you could take the derivative of these things, and then you have the steepness as the um, amplitude of the disk here. Um, uh, um, and that is then uh, closely related to the uh, loudness that, no, to the sound pressure level that you produce. Okay. So let's see uh, what the steepness of the pulse uh, end uh, does. It is then uh, just a summary of what I just said. Uh, this is determining the sound pressure level STL. Uh, you could see it here. We have the S versus the maximum flow declination rate, the, the steepness of the closing part of the local airflow. And uh, this is a, a subject that is um, thinner, of course, because it has good control uh, of, of the fundamental frequency and in different loudnesses. 
Uh, so you see that they, the, the points are closely uh, concentrated uh, on the set, on uh, the. So you could uh, you could then ask, what is the price of the decibel? Uh, how much uh, air pressure do I need to pay in order to to get a certain level uh, of the sound pressure level? And you could ask, for instance, what uh, what what is uh, ten centimeters of water column? Producing well, in most people, it is around 80 decibels at 30 centimeters of distance. So that is uh, one characteristic. Uh, and uh, you could also ask if you double the, the sublocker pressure, how much decibels do you gain? Well, the um, the answer is then about nine decibels, nine, eight, or eleven decibels, something around that. Um, and um, that is then uh, these are or or, or finger data, uh, and you can see that they are very nicely correlated. Sound pressure level is very nicely correlated with the log of sublocker pressure. Okay, so you could be a bit vulgar and say that MFT or maximum flow declination rate determines the sound pressure level if you have um, a constant um, uh, vowel. Okay, so uh, effect of sublocker pressure on the spectrum. Well, that's very interesting also, uh, because um, if we take an average spectrum of running speed and uh, um, uh, ask the person to read the same text with different degrees of vocal loudness, you get an average spectrum that looks like that. With This is 500 hertz, which is a general typical speed in the spectrum of speed. And then you have a spec, yeah, and so on and so forth. Okay, and what happens uh, when you increase uh, or make this softer? Well, then you have this kind of, of um, a typical um, average spectrum, and if it is loud, you, you, you get something like that. So what the difference is, is the flow between about 600 hertz and 3,000 hertz, and that is then uh, varying systematically with the subglossal pressure. And uh, um, in loud, you could get on a long time average spectrum about four decibels flow per octave, about between 600 hertz and 3000 hertz. And then uh, in, in um, uh, neutral, some four decibels, no, some, um, this is four, six, and eight decibels per octave. It's just a little mistake that keep you awake. Okay, uh, now a footnote between the two of us. Um, SPL and vocal loudness, sound pressure level and vocal loudness, how closely they are they related? SPL is the standard measure of vocal loudness in all clinical work to say that it is 60 decibels and 40 centimeters or something like that, and that to specify. But it is actually, is it actually a happy marriage? Uh, well, vocal loudness is, the limitation is that vocal loudness is almost entirely de de determined by the strongest parcel in the spectrum, one single parcel in the spectrum. And what determines this um, um, single parcel? Well, let's look at uh, one example uh, uh, where we have the pitch of T3, and uh, then we produce the same, uh, with the same vowel, um, we, uh, at F4, and you could see then that the SPL here will be 74, 73 decibels, and here it will be 80 decibels, just because the pitch change. It's not the sublocal pressure, it's not the loudness, it's just the, 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 the pitch. And then, of course, it will change the form and frequency, the resonances of the vocal tract, the, uh, the position of the loudest spectrum will change the frequency, and also in in some some level. So um, the uh, uh, the the conclusion on the SPL and the vocal loudness is that it's a very unhappy matter. Footnote N here. Okay. Let me now go on to change sublocker pressure uh, and pitch. Uh, so um, you could you could test that. So you could also get the. Uh, Pulsating our flow by blowing your fingers. And how much could you change the pitch uh, with just uh, changing the pressure? You could change it a lot. Uh, so that means that when, we, when you increase the 
to the local treasure, you get a higher peak, which is uh, then of death in singing, of course, by the composer is supposed to uh, decide the peak. So um, uh, in singing, you must uh, assume the control of the peak and don't let the sub of pressure decide it. Uh, so um, um, this is then a problem if you don't compensate for the effect of pitch change due to a crescendo or a high, higher sub of pressure. Um, and you could, of course, also add a few semitones to your range by singing them loudly, because then some of the contribution to the pitch is coming from the block of tension. But you would never sing those high pitches softly. And Verdi and other composers are well aware of that. So um, they, uh, they offer um, um, occasions to sing super pitch uh, in the piatti pipette pianissimo. Um, and this is an example from Verdi's Requiem, where you have pom, 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 pom. Um, and that should be four things in that. So um, uh, if, you, if the singer is soprano uh, using a couple of pressure, he won't be bought for that uh, role, I think. Okay, voice control uh, number three. What was it? We have talked about the block of pressure and the stretching and the um, of the vocal pose, and now I come to the aspect that I promised to return to, and that is um, glottal adduction, phonation time. Glottal adduction is what you change when you, uh, uh, when you, when you carry a piano and speak at the same time, which means that you have squeezed the glottis, press the vocal pose together, and when you are talking to your neighbor in a concert, giving a piano, a mathematics of the orchestra, uh, which is a very weak uh, glottal adduction. Glottal adduction has a vital uh, function. It, 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 it is necessary to close the glottis if somebody is trying to invade your, your lungs. OK, um, maybe I will have the possibility to uh, demonstrate this, we could uh, analyze uh, the uh, voice by, uh, by inverse taking away the uh, implant of the vocal track, and let's see if it works. Uh, uh, it does not. Okay. It does not work. Well, okay. um, um, so I'm, I'm not. Really but the, I tell you what we would have seen, and <laughs> Uh, that uh, there is a very strong effect on the on the uh, flow glottogram on the glottal air flow. If you have a neutral uh, voice, you have a clear flow space and a triangular pulse that is tilting a bit to the right. And if you uh, have um, a, a breathy voice, uh, you have a more, more almost sinusoidal wave form because the vocal folds never contact; they just uh, change the glottal area. And then um, you have also a, press, uh, um, a degree of uh, vocal fold adduction, of glottal adduction that is between the breathy and neutral, and that is called flow phonation, and it sounds like this. Uh, so you, you spend a lot of air, uh, but you still have vocal fold contact it, instead of neutral phonation, which sounds more like this. And then you have, of course, the press phonation that sounds like this. And um, the, uh, uh, the effect on the sound is, of course, quite big, uh, as you could hear. And you could uh, change, uh, you could measure that. Uh, and the main thing here is the second aspect that is important on, of the uh, glottal airflow, and that is the peak-to-peak -peak amplitude of the flow. Uh, and the peak-to-peak -peak amplitude of the flow uh, which then uh, varies with glottal adduction and phonation type, uh, that has a very, very strong uh, correlation with an acoustic property, and that is the amplitude of the fundamental. And we plot it here as a function of the uh, um, AC pulse, the, the pulse, peak to peak pulse amplitude of the flow, and then you get this. This is the singer. And uh, the correlation here is almost endless, uh, close to uh, one. 
and um, um, when he does breast pronation, it is a bit less, but in um, breathy, in, in singing, and in neutral pronation, they all uh, follow this uh, high correlation, um, linear correlation. Okay, so uh, that was it. Uh, if you want to change uh, the amplitude of the, um, of the fundamental in your spectrum, you should go to a more um, relaxed connection. And maybe I could uh, try to find it, if I could uh, demonstrate the effect. Uh, here is that. And let's see if uh, we have it here. Uh, should I get the sound of the, um, of the synthesizer? It is the output here. Uh, yes, this is. And uh, we could, here we have the spectrum of the of the normal. normal so it so doesn't uh, just pay, uh, fall down, but it is uh, straight line. But uh, we could, uh, we could uh, say stop, but we have just the sign of something like this. Yeah. And we have the overtone. Okay. So now, what I would like to talk about is what happens when people are likely to increase local reduction and put local pressure too much. And we go here uh, up to, to uh, um, uh, these uh, four. And, uh, to what so what and then I will change the amplitude of the voice source. So here is the neutral voice source. It's, uh, there is a, a big effect uh, in the low frequency parts, in the base <laughs> kind, that you also get in breathing noise when you speak like this, and in slow phonation when you speak like this, but not so much in breath phonation when you have, it sounds like a small loudspeaker. Okay, important, uh, because the spectrum effect of increased local reduction is reduced amplitude of the fundamental, and uh, um, um, and um, you just heard it. And here we see it demonstrated. Uh, the, it is the same for a pitch. It is the same fundamental frequency. It's the same formant, and that is a, a pitch. The first parcel could vary about 10 decibels in extreme cases. So five decibels is already readily heard. Okay, glottal reduction is what controls uh, the phonation type. I, I call phonation type uh, the variation from breath to uh, slow to neutral to press. Uh, and um, uh, if you increase it, you get more hyperfunctional phonation. And uh, then the air consumption is reduced, uh, of course, because you, you don't let so much air out in the single pulse. And then we have uh, a reference to vocal pedagogy, uh, where the tradition from the old time is to keep the candles in front of the mouth and see that the, 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 uh, the um, light, it, it doesn't flicker. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, um, that is like an insurance policy. It is valid, but you need to read the fine, low uh, text. Uh, uh, and that is not what is not mentioned. First, you, uh, you, you, it works only if you have a wide lip opening. If you have a narrow opening, it will be start to thicker. And of course, if you have a hyperfunctional phonation, you also reduce the airflow, so it will stay thin. So, um, but people uh, don't need to talk about that because. Uh, uh, it is sort of a silent condition. Okay, reduction and voice source. Reduction, phonation type, 
and uh, fundamental. So this is a continuous thing, and uh, I think you will um, admit that it has a strong aesthetic, uh, aesthetic uh, effect. It is so flashy. Or if it's so flashy, you have, have a quite different emotional color of your communication. And that can be used, of course, in, in pop music. It is very much too. OK, yes, you enjoyed the lovely sound of the fundamental already, so we don't need to do that. Hyperfunctional phonation is taxing for the vocal tones, and that is very important. If you have habitually uh, uh, too much glossal adduction, you will hurt your vocal tones and you will get nodules or other dysphonic um, um, voices. And, that, and um, that, that is then important. And that there are also in the pedagogy um, tricks to encourage flow. Uh, and avoid uh, too low uh, airflow. And that is uh, rrr, the, uh, uh, and the lip trill, mm -hmm. uh, and also uh, Philippe Allaire in Portugal has found, has sh shown the effect of the flow ball, which is a little instrument, which is um, very, very thick, and it is a, a ball that is a, a light ball that is in the end of a basket. And in the, uh, there is a tube uh, that goes into the basket, and then you then you phonate through the tube, and the ball will go up if the flow is good, and it will rest in the basket if it's not. So it is a wonderful tool to direct the uh, attention of the student to our flow, which otherwise could pass uh, or be difficult to describe. Yeah, so I would say long live a generous airflow and long live the fundamentals. <clears throat> uh, okay, so we have three physiological control parameters. Vocal loudness, uh, that is controlled by the glossal pressure, vocal cold length and tension, pitch, and glossal reduction for phonation time. I will now tell, uh, yeah, and what about the little gearbox, the, um, the register? Well, uh, vocal registers um, could be uh, named by different uh, like this, and uh, uh, it is generally possible to separate them by breaks. And for breaks are probably uh, forbidden in most focus sites, except like this text by in Jodering. And this is the typical um, uh, shape of the glossal airflow in falsetto and in modal. Uh, and that is, this is uh, speech like, and this is oh, yeah, yeah, that kind of voice. And you could see that the uh, the, the close pace is a bit uh, unclear here, and the, the, and the pulse is disturbed, and here the pulse is, uh, the close pace is more and more. Okay, I will now, <clears throat> uh, uh, yeah, what you could say that in most vocal styles we don't accept a break. So <laughs> what happens then with the register? Do they disappear, or maybe they are just hidden by some technical thing? And I think that is the truth. Now, <coughs> two short addendum. Less control and this effect of run. The mechanism uh, looks like this, as you might be uh, aware of. Uh, we had the, the, the diaphragm. The diaphragm. Uh, the diaphragm is a thin dome-shaped layer of muscle yeah, and tendon yeah, that separates the abdominal cavity and, and from the and chest cavity. The floor it gains its shape from its top the the from the organs that surround it, that that especially the heart, the lungs, and liver. The, the, diaphragm. Diaphragm. the diaphragm attaches at the mouth. If, if you, if you uh, contract the diaphragm, diaphragm your abdominal wall will, will be expanded. That is, uh, uh, that is not the go to the This is what happens. And when, when, when you uh, do uh, contract your abdominal wall, the diaphragm goes up. Uh, yeah. and, and that, that has, has an effect uh, relevant, relevant to the voice because the lungs, lungs possess mass and, and weight kilos of course, and in upright and sitting position, the lungs want to, to pull the larynx down. down. Uh, and and, and the, the interesting thing is, is that, that the downward, downward pull is associated with an adduction, a separation of the vocal folds. So here is the mechanical coupling between the breathing technique and the voice source. And so the force is strong after deep inhalation because the then the diaphragm is low and lots of pillows are hanging in the and then it 
it's uh, smaller when the, during the installation. So breathing strategy can start to explanate it. And, and you could start on the trace of the deep installation, and then the diaphragm is low, and then you tend to with non press connection. But if you start to uh, first pay a bit, uh, then the diaphragm goes up, and you have less help to avoid over adapting the vocal cords. Mm -hmm. So probably good for hypo functional voices to start with the deep inhalation, but for hypo, the uh, breathy point, uh, breath, breathy people, they will probably start with a bit lower um, glottal adduction to avoid uh, breathy mm -hmm. And then this is has an application of the um, exercises that you do. You could have an ascending or descending melody. And if you have a descending the melody, the high notes come at high lung volume, so they get felt in not being breath. And in uh, this ending, you have the opposite. Uh, so then the high note appears at low lung volume. The lung volume, of course, always goes down during the test. Yeah. yeah. High difficult tone in the face yeah, could often be much more easy to produce if you take a little mini inhalation before that. Uh, that is now, the second little uh, addendum, and that is the note. Uh, which I had been um, uh, uh, enjoying the night of cooperation with Miriam Havel in Munich. Uh, is it a friend or is it a foe? Well, that depends. Uh, we look like this. Uh, if we, um, we have a lot of holes in our head, and there are actually six of them. We could look at this is the maxillary, and here it would be the uh, frontal, and then uh, in the sign, in the from sign ring, you also see the senoidal sinus that is exactly over the end to the nose cavity. Okay. Uh, so, so we, we made an experiment, Miriam and I, with 3D models, models of the vocal tract coupled to a nasal tract via small tube. So here we have the vocal tract with a little earphone sending a sine wave and then and we have, have microphone at the microphone. And, and then we had uh, the uh, note, uh, and we coupled the vocal tract to the note with the uh, coupling tube of different types. And this is what we see. This is the sine wave response of the vocal tract plus the nose, but here there was no native passage at all. So uh, then you get the typical uh, frequency curve, transfer function with a form and peak and so on. Now, if we open a small passage, uh, we uh, get this, uh, and you can see that uh, the level difference between the main resonance of the vocal tract Here's the first four members, and the uh, fourth um, um, vocal tract resonance in this fourth four months is six decibels here. When you open a bit of opening to the main nasal tract, and it's much more here. So the spectrum balance is tilting a bit when you uh, do small. And if you do it too much, and make you a distinction, then you get this. Um, so then you get a very strong high frequency emphasis, but you don't get very much here in the low frequency end. So that is the typical sound of the nasalization. Okay. Uh, you could also, yeah, the native sinuses are also blamed for being extremely important to the singing. And this is a lie. Uh, you uh, can see how much they um, 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 contribute to the frequency curve of the vocal tract with a narrow velopharyngeal um, opening, opening and, and with a wide one that sounds down impossible down to use. Then you then have one native resonance here, here that is the main resonance from posterior above to the nostril, and then you have also one kind of resonance here, a little wiggle in the frequency curve, and then here at high frequency you have had enough problem with the tenor. Okay, so don't put too much emphasis on the kind of resonance. They are, as I always think about this when I talk about it, they are like custom service. Because they have a favorite resonance, which is the resonance which is the other cavity. And as soon as the sound passes that contains that 
Okay, so summarizing, so for the pressure control to local loudness increases the amplitude of higher process and increases the peak. And for the reduction controls the formation type from hypo hypo to flow to numerous to hyper formation. That reduces the flow pulse amplitude and air consumption, and that determines the dominance of the fundamental spectrum. And the tracheal pull increases with increasing lung volume. It's uh, um, it gets stronger when the abdominal wall is expanded uh, than when it is contracting. It pulls the larynx down, down and it tends to reduce the duct. And that was the end of my little talk. Thank you very much. One, two, one, two, there we go. Um, is there a limit of subglottic air pressure on how much the vocal folds can, so a limit of maximal subglottic pressure on, on what will make the vocal folds adduct rather than abduct? So there, is there too much air pressure? So taking a big so taking a big breath might have limitations. So finding the balance, really. Yeah. Thank you. I have one more question, if I may. Um, in the in the endoscopy uh, of the high speed endoscopy we saw, and we talk about how the cricothyroid contraction, the cricothyroid muscle, creates the tilt of the thyroid in order to stretch the vocal folds. But in the endoscopy, it always seems, and you talk, talked about it, the arytenoids actually look like they're leaning back. So instead of seeing a forward pull, we see a backward tilt. Can you comment on that? Why do we see that? Tilt back to the high for the stretch. There must be some contraction of the arytenoid muscles as well, the coupled arytenoid muscles. Sure. 
еще? Okay, so uh, we were talking yesterday uh, about some um, performance in women, which is not much in the theater uh, school. So I, it was very interesting, but we said that should we see some kind of little bit like on that and we could explore the future. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, before going to the third speaker, because um, he is already connected uh, from UK, so we're, we are in delay. So I'm sorry, Claudia, you're going to present later. I would like uh, just to say some words about uh, Professor Johann Sundberg, because after I will introduce uh, Professor Graham Well. So it's our honor to have uh, the founder of the science of the singing voice. Johann Sundberg uh, is born in Stockholm and he studied uh, musicology at the Uppsala University in 1956. 
he is Dr. Honoris Causa at the University of York and uh, the 2014 at the University of Athens and has a personal chair emeritus in music acoustics at the Department of Speech, Music and Hearing at the KTH Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm. He early became interested in the acoustical aspects of music starting with a doctoral dissertation work on the organ pipes. After the dissertation, singing voice in music performance has been his main research topics. He led the music acoustics research group from 1970 to 2004 in Musicens Ludlara Sandberg. Uh, 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 yes, in Music and Sludiara, Sandberg presents music acoustics in popularized form to the interested layman. As the president of the Music Acoustics Committee of the Royal Swedish Academy of Music, Sandberg has been the editor of eight volumes in a series of proceedings of public seminar on music acoustics themes arranged in Stockholm since 1975. Sandberg has also had extensive experience of performing music. For 24 years, he was a member of the Stockholm Bach Choir, nine years as its president. He has studied singing for Dagmar Gustafsson, and made his public debut with a leader recital on his uh, 50th uh, birthday. And he's a member of the Royal Swedish Academy of Music, of the Swedish uh, Acoustical Society, and uh, he is also um, a fellow of the Acoustical Society of America. And he's our mentor. So thank you very much, Johan. <clears throat> and now we will present you Professor Graham Wells. He couldn't be with us because uh, he had uh, many uh, things to do and uh, he's very sorry. So Professor Graham Wells uh, holds the UCL Institute of Education established uh, chair of music educations, education since 2001. He is elected chair of the internationally based Society for Education, Music and Psychology Research, a past president of the International Society for Music Education, ISME, and past co-chair of the ISME Research. And he holds a lot of visiting professorships all over the world. The most important for our project is that he acted as the specialist external consultant in the area of uh, children's singing and vocal development for UK and Italian government agencies. And so it is very important that he is with us because he has led uh, a research project uh, for four years in UK for uh, the singing uh, visual feedback in the schools of the UK. It's uh, very close to our project. And uh, he has published a lot of papers with uh, Professor Evangelos Kimonidis on the uh, 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 awareness of the singing voice by children in different uh, intercultural environments uh, by using visual feedback techniques. Welcome, Professor Graham Wells. We're waiting. Uh, uh, it, it is said 11 o'clock, okay. So, uh, what else? Uh, <laughs> yes. No, no, we said that. Uh, are you sure it's okay? Because it, uh, we can... Uh, Maybe uh, maybe uh, we can continue maybe with Claudia because uh, we cannot wait. <laughs> so I will present also Claudia. If he connects, it's okay. Otherwise, uh, we cannot wait long because uh, 
We have a lot to look for. Okay. So it's, it's still a lot, Natalia, and all the, the hours. You could be that the first educator, you know, educator. Yeah. That's So, in order to not, uh, we're not going to touch, uh, we must touch up uh, the program. Okay. We're going to present Claudia. You are going to speak and maybe she's not on time. I'm sorry. So, uh, we're also very pleased to have Claudia Manfredi, who is a member of ITG. And he is currently an associate professor of biomedical engineering at the Department of Information Engineering, Università degli Studi di Firenze, Italy. Her research interests include biomedical signal processing with applications with the analysis of EEG, ECG, video recordings, and the human voice. On the latter subject, she has been organizing the the annual uh, international workshop Maveba since 1999, where we have uh, participated many times. She's the author of more than 120 peer-reviewed papers indexed in Scopus. She is a member of ITCLE Bini uh, E Society, Italian Bioengineering Group, International Speech and Communication Association, Collegium Medicorum, etc. And she's also the editor of the Mabeva Proceedings series and the guest editor of special issues on the journals, including the European Acoustics Association, Medical Engineering and Physics, and Biomedical Signal Processing and Control. So welcome. <laughs> welcome, Claudia. Okay, thank you very much. Hello. So, thank you very much. And uh, especially, I would like to thank uh, Professor uh, uh, Dirgati that invited me to this interesting uh, meeting uh, with this week and uh, you know, wonderful place. I, I love this, I love the uh, patents. Yes. Many years ago, and now I have to be all day. So, um, 
I would like to present some results and uh, methods for the analysis of the singing voice. This is the research that we carried on <clears throat> some years ago with the professor uh, uh, Dejan Kerr. I suppose many of you know him uh, from Belgium. And recently, with my PhD student, uh, Lorenzo Cassini, he joined to get his PhD degree in emotion. So, uh, the aim of this uh, presentation are to present you some uh, acoustical parameters, so objective parameters that can give the uh, quantify. Uh, some characteristics that are typically perceptual that are uh, related to vibrato, namely its frequency, amplitude, duration, and its irregularity or not irregularity. And some words about the single format, which was explained to you a few minutes ago very, very well. But by Professor Schimberger. I will just give you some possible techniques to measure, to quantify uh, the single form. And uh, we, I present uh, an application concerning differences, stylistic, the differences between uh, a question of a single and just that. And this is the aim this is to see the uh, objective uh, evaluation of perceptual differences. And we will do this extraction uh, parameters and uh, applying the statistical analysis and also some uh, machine learning techniques for statistics. So, which are the parameters that we have uh, uh, implemented in our software? The link to the software, uh, which is freely downloadable, downloadable is below. And uh, these are the main parameters. So, we will quantify the vibrato frequency, its extension. It is measured in, uh, in a unified range uh, of senses. Uh, it's the regularity and the irregularity in frequency, um, which is something similar to Jupiter and to know in entity. Its duration, uh, the, the average term, and the single form. So there are the few uh, formulas. We know what is uh, vibrato, we know what is the rate of vibrato, and what we did to implement this fresh uh, uh, formula that shows uh, the measure of the rate of, of vibrato. So the point, one point was which in which range is As we to measure the grato. And uh, we uh, found that these uh, possible ranges for females and males. This is from a paper uh, uh, below. And uh, because there is no standard, no rule, special rule, we decided to apply the largest range, which is the female one. So we, we look for the grato in this frequency range. Of course, it's a software tool, so we have to take some uh, rules for this. The same uh, for the extension of the grato. And uh, this is normalized in this uh, uh, unit of measure, since mm -hmm. you I'm sure that you know much better than me. I'm not a singer. I don't play music, so I I know this by some literature. I know that it's uh, the measure that allows 
to um, to have a, a clock, to have a unified measure of this uh, extension independent of uh, the singular characteristic, male, female, or whatever. And we implemented two uh, measures of uh, possible uh, of singularity of the Draco, which are the analogous of what is measured in uh, in balls, um, as uh, Professor Gergati said, I am uh, mainly dealing with pathological voices, with uh, problems uh, in the voice that may be related to uh, anomalies uh, in the vocal structure or in the vocal cords or at the same time as the system level. So uh, these are very good voices. Actually, no irregularity. But uh, uh, anyway, we want to measure these two parameters so which are the analogous of the standard difference in the measure. And other parameters are the duration of the vibrato. As I will show you, there will be uh, differences between the two sides. Artist and just singers, and uh, also the standard deviation for all the parameters. And this will account for the ability of the subject to sustain the tone in the red rapid. And we uh, publish the paper with the people below, some years ago, where there are more details about. And the vocal intonation, the vocal intonation means that the average tone, so we give a, a measure and also some pictures where the vocal intonation in this case is given by this process. And we can give a measure of this, so if the finger is able to keep, to maintain, to stay in the note or not, or with the possible between uh, operatic and and the, the single format. The single format uh, is uh, typical of uh, male craft singers, okay? and uh, in this picture you see a comparison between uh, what we obtained uh, in the mean, uh, as far as red, the classic fingers, and in blue, modern red fingers. So we can see the big difference, uh, and uh, this is the what uh, Dr. Kissinger explained uh, the, uh, the high energy range, uh, which is usually between 3,000 and 4,000 hertz. But we had to implement something in our software, so we had to set some rules to, to get this measure. And what we did and what we found from the experience that this special uh, did not be fixed, it varied. It varies because of the finger, of the style, of the gender. So we implemented a um, not so a little bit complex uh, uh, method. And uh, with this method, we make these pictures. They can vary according to the finger, according to the style. And uh, we measure this uh, quantity, and uh, we um, find uh, a way to quantify the energy uh, of the single format. And what we did, we 
evaluate the um, area that means for the amount of energy uh, of the first two corners and divided this area uh, with the area of the first fourth and fifth corners. You can find the definition in literature and uh, we call it as you can find in the literature as qualification. So the qualification is a um, it is the measure of the balance between the energy of the two first two forms as related to the three third fourth and fifth. So ideally, if you are a good singer, these two areas should be almost the same. So the three first should be almost the same one. So uh, we apply this to three sets of uh, uh, recordings coming from uh, two groups, Western Class singers and Jazz singers. Just to, to see if the software was able to differentiate the size. So some characteristics of the voice, the singer, the jazz singer, and that of the Western Class singer. Uh, we know that uh, these uh, two kind of singing uh, styles uh, depends on the several factors. Uh, of course, the environment is really different. Uh, the theater quite silent in some cases, in many cases, and just in the uh, different environment, smaller or maybe noisy. The musical component is different. It's an orchestra, maybe this is a uh, a small group of the uh, and also usually uh, the singers do not use any kind of amplification while the singers usually do. So there are different conditions. And uh, we uh, would to, to compare this style, we found uh, something that is uh, Quite common no? is uh, well known by any any singer, which is the uh, the small part of the uh, song, the summertime in uh, the Dessin opera, Cousin Day. And this is uh, fitted uh, both for Western literature and the uh, yeah, style. And especially we analyze the thing in the word summertime. Don't ask me to sing it, but you know what I mean. Okay. So, and um, you see just a first look at the, the spectrum, how different they look in a question interactive uh, and in just style. And this is, of course, the stylistic uh, choice of the singer. It does not mean at all that one is better than the other. It's a different style. And especially in this picture, I made a zoom and the same part, which is uh, characterized by High vibrato in very Western operatic studio. So, this is the reason why we restricted the analysis to this part. Because here you can find vibrato. So, we uh, recorded the uh, 42 professional singers, uh, the different uh, styles, and there were 11 male just singers, five just five male just singers, 12 female and 14, uh, 12 female just, 14 just female singers. And with this uh, age range, many, most of them were recorded uh, at the Cherubini Conservatory in Firenze, but some other were recorded uh, other private singing schools in Italy. 
So uh, one of uh, uh, the first plot, the first plot uh, is uh, shown here. So you can clearly see the battle in this service. This is the main Western Operatic Kingdom. This is started from summertime. Okay. And uh, here you can see uh, what the software is do. The rate of the battle, five, about five hertz. Uh, the uh, value in terms of the extension, which is uh, around uh, 31 hertz, and the vocal information, so the note, we didn't impose any, uh, of any uh, note for the singers. Everyone was thinking with this recorded uh, note. And in this case, the note the information was 372. This is quite a difference, the same plot constant for a male that single. Uh, so, of course, they just single don't usually don't sing with the very strong vibrato. And in, in this case, it's almost no vibrato. It is the rate is uh, still uh, around the six hertz. Plus the amplitude intensity is smaller, the extension is much smaller, and the vocal intonation for this finger is 124. So, this is just to show you that I, um, that, uh, if uh, one wants to see these parameters for this voice in the text, this is the female uh, Western Interactive case. Yeah. And the, uh, the parameters are shown here. There is a very high extension for the and the bottom information is quite close to 500 hertz. And the very large amplitude of the vibrato, and the rate is in the, in the range 5.7. And this is the uh, last example. Almost, almost no vibrato, a little bit. And you can see the parameters are really quite different, although the vocal information is very high. So you can have a measure on the picture of your support. But, and I, I will show you the limits of this, of this approach. So uh, this is what is nice, but there are many things that are not so nice. Um, this is the, the picture of the, uh, what I told you before, the measure of the um, formant and the formant ratio, so the single formant. And in this picture, the stars, red stars means formant, that are found by the software. It's actually absolutely not easy to detect formant with the software tool. There are many, many consistent, many difficulties. So in this case, things went quite well. We could find five formants, and this uh, has the people in factors that were dynamically found by the software. As I told you before, they have not fixed, but they move in a, in a range of According to the voice, according, according to the kind of the image. And we measure the ratio between the energy 
the third component and the energy is the third, fourth, and fifth. And the ratio was 2.66, which is very good. So that means that the energy of the single component is similar to the energy of the first component. So it's a very good performance over the main working. And the next is uh, the comparison, what happens with the male jet single. There is almost no single hormone. And he uses the quality that is very high. That means that the energy of the first performance is much higher than that of the And so you can have also this kind of information, numerical information, quantity. This is another example for a female uh, 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 What happens? What happens? In fact, yes, you can find just this corner. And so, if uh, uh, we don't implement, we didn't implement some rules to have the measure of the single format anyway, we couldn't be there. So, the, the rules, as I told you, are quite complex. I don't explain to you, but the software could anyway find these two vectors and measure the energy instead the rest of the energy between the first two and what is in this area. Although they could find in this just one corner. The other two maybe are one here and the other one here, but not always we can uh, we can pick it. And the quality ratio is 10 out of 10, which is the same in the Western Graphics. So this confirms with what the Professor Swinberg did as well. For women, we must be careful. This is the uh, uh, female finger that has a uh, fundamental frequency around it. Uh, 500 hertz so over the range of one more. And that shows that the single format for a female is, in this example, is lower than that of the male. So, some results, statistical results. What is uh, in red the means uh, high, high. A significant statistical difference between the uh, groups. You can see that, in example, the pitch for females is significant, significantly higher than any other group. Still, for females, the extension of the grado is much higher. Future in uh, male and female operatic singers is much lower than jazz singers, that means much more regular. Also for singers, the numbers show that there is a, a much lower female. So uh, irregularity in extension of the graph for the the quality ratio is much higher for male operatic singers, confirmed here. And the, also the direction of the vibrato aim is much higher in operatic singers than in just singers. So these are statistical results with the uh, Traditional techniques, parameters were uh, distributed normally, so they could use ANOVA and uh, the techniques. And uh, so these are results, as I told you. And uh, so extension is much higher in Western graphics. Regularity is much higher in Western graphics. And the duration, again, is much higher in Western graphics. And the single format is much higher, so uh, the quality data is close to one in what's in operatic single, especially in 
Then we try to apply uh, machine learning approach across the to uh, find some difference. So we apply the number of tasks. Between it to between male and female, between it to between Western and African and and uh, within the name, between it to between Western and African and Jacksonville, and between it to between male and female. And also find out which are the most relevant statistical parameters in values. So just to show you very quickly, this is uh, the histogram of uh, the predictors, more relevant predictors when I use, we use all the features, features uh, 29 features, uh, all the features uh, concerning uh, what, what we could uh, compute with our software. So we This is the first task is distinguishing between male and female. Yes. So these are the main relevant parameters. So you can see F0, F3, F5 formats mainly are the main relevant parameters. This is obvious because male and female have different values. So we decided to remove uh, Parameters concerning the fundamental frequency and the first type volume, and we found that differences are related mainly to uh, mainly to vibrato extension, polyphasicity, uh, sense, and extension. That means that uh, if you want to discriminate between male and and consider a fundamental frequency in the formal frequency basis, not so uh, relevant that is to consider other things. Operatic versus class fingers. Again, we uh, made a, a comparison considering all the parameters uh, and just <coughs> those that do not involve the fundamental frequency and uh, formats. You can see which are the most relevant parameters to gain duration, uh, sense, uh, extension, and so on, all together, male and female. And then we discriminate between male and female. For male, we can see there are the number of parameters that include parameter frequency and performance frequency. And you, if you exclude these parameters, Duration, place, ventilation, and uh, extension are the main parameters. And something similar, I don't know. If you for females again, I think that a base, base the difference on fundamental frequency is not correct. Better to exclude the fundamental frequency and formal frequency and find the most relevant parameters. And this uh, kind of thing. And these are uh, in summary of the results. We read the, the best results. So, accuracy is up to 95% in creating the old features, of course, with the great information. If we exclude the fundamental frequency and the uh, performance, this uh, accuracy. Goes down for 86%. What's it? And other parameters you see, the results are quite good. I found it in red this number because the blind uh, so so um, data is these results that are not much good, so much good. And indeed, you can see the accuracy is not so high, 81% or 75% in this case. So it's better to 
uh, work with math, I remember of recording. Um, anyway, uh, for things in between female operatic and dress singers, we have 92% of uh, accuracy that's quite accurate. So this is the end of the uh, analysis, uh, the acoustic analysis. What we try to do is to uh, add the voice also the state, the, uh, the expression of the, the state of the singer. So how can we uh, extract this kind of parameters from the state? There are many techniques. Uh, we tried with uh, the technique that uh, find some relevant points in space uh, and measures angles and positions, uh, uh, relative positions to um, give uh, um, an idea of the emotional state, uh, state of the singer and, and as a consequence, uh, the expressive field of the singer. And uh, we, we did not go part at all, but idea to be for you, for who is going to study this uh, and go on to study this aspect, to combine the audio analysis plus uh, tables, the tables and what, okay, to the analysis of this kind of video analysis to uh, put together this information and just be able to personalize for self monitoring for the individual performance. And now the limit, the limit systems of our uh, software and uh, we must be fair uh, when we use the software, the other software. One is the uh, problem that you have to avoid pointing when you put your frame, audio frame into the software, you should cut the strengthening because it may uh, alter the result. And here, the signal is very high, but because there is this part of the, of the signal, it should be cut off before. And this is usually made, must be made manually. So, be care of this. Uh, another point is problem of finding quality ratio and formats. So, uh, what is the best thing to do? Use this uh, approach or just The maximum in the frequency range, the uh, pixel frequency range, and make the ratio between these two, or what could be done. This is a uh, uh, question mark for you. Okay. I'm going to study this. And there are a lot of units. In our software, the analysis is not in real time, it's offline. We uh, analyze three subjects, maybe better results to be more data. Uh, I still am convinced that there's the feeling feature experience and the feeling experience is the first thing, the most important thing, and then with the software you can give uh, the need something more. Perceptual uh, analysis, I think, is the first thing to do. And uh, of course, uh, audio and video analysis could be very nice, but uh, what can we do? Yes, of course, the smartphone is the easiest thing to do. Uh, what is the quality? And uh, there are also problems with the uh, light. With the distance of the smartphone, a lot of problems. And uh, uh, from a numerical point of view, manage video resolution, audio quality. 
Thank you very much, Claudia, for a very this very interesting research between the comparison of uh, the singers in yeah. opera and jazz, and especially the focus on the vibrato, which is very important. And uh, my first question before asking the other is uh, if you have used the EGG for all this. Uh, no. Without it. No. Okay. We don't. Okay. Thank you. And so, do you have any questions? Because after we must go for a cough break. I was wondering about uh, the frequency limit that you use for the quality ratio. Mm -hmm. uh, where is it? Is it 2,000 hertz or 1,000 hertz? Or uh, uh, there are the, the software makes a choice. First of all, it, it finds five hormones in the almost 2,000, 5,000 hertz, more or less, that's a place. It, it computes the energy uh, of the first two and the energy of the third for the mm -hmm. energy. If the, they cannot be found for many reasons, numerical and also acoustical and so on, mm -hmm. It anyway computes. So in, in the in the first case, these crystals are not fixed. So first deployment around two uh, thousand, so a little bit less, a little bit more. And uh, after the fifth deployment, it should be five thousand, five thousand, fifty thousand, one hundred. Otherwise. Uh, if uh, the chocolate doesn't find five hormones, it keeps the threshold around, don't remember exactly, mm -hmm. 3,500. Uh, the first one, you know, 5,500. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. And the, uh, um, it is spectrum peaks that it is looking for and counting the number of spectrum peaks. So if there is a cluster, uh, several formants will be in the same peak, uh, and that will then uh, extend the yeah. upper part of the. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, thank you for the very interesting talk. Uh, I would like to ask something. Uh, it is um, generally accepted to musicians that the onset of the jazz vibrato comes much later than in classical singing. And in this example that we heard, the, the, um, the notes were too short for a jazz singer to start a vibrato. So maybe it would be, um, there are um, other uh, Parts in either point uh, in the songs that we have recorded where they have a tenuta, they have a, mm -hmm. a, a sustained note where, where the vibrato would be more prominent. Yes, I agree. Just thinking, sorry. Yes, I agree with you. And uh, the choice was made uh, mainly by Professor Dijon Okay. That uh, uh, we had to, to find a, a 
the trainer would, would uh, emphasize vibrato mm -hmm. in both sides. And along the summertime song, uh, maybe there was some part which was more suitable for jazz singers, but not for uh, classical operatic singers. Okay. So we made a, a, a compromise mm -hmm. um, some way. You are right, indeed, uh, the vibrato frame is much shorter mm -hmm. in this case for jazz singers. This was just an experiment. Yes, of course. Yeah, of course. You can make any, any other of course. trial with other songs, with other and, and parts of the song. Thank you. Yeah. And, and the second question I had uh, is some um, uh, classical singers tend to change uh, their acoustic and especially the vibrato properties when uh, singing in different auditoria. So when they're in um, a, a classical or auditorium, or like an opera stage, it would be interesting to try and measure them in their natural habitat yeah. uh, and see <laughs> what their vibrato is there. Maybe change from the studio. Maybe. Indeed. We made the recordings in the studio mm -hmm. Maybe. with More. a professional Experiment. microphone, but yeah, and so in a small room, much more than this, and without orchestra, of course, uh, yes. so, on. so I can add you to the limit. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. It's, it's very interesting. Thank you. And dear Professor, your presentation was uh, very interesting. I would like to ask you something about the software that uh, you used. Uh, is it possible for us to to use it? Is it free? So yes, absolutely free. You can download from the website. Oh, maybe I can give the uh, the slide. So yes, where's the the, the link? The link of so, all. It is completely free and uh, be careful for a user. As I told you, it's completely automatic, but first you must manually select the, what you want to, to analyze. The measure. You can, you can uh, record your voice, uh, uh, you can listen, you can analyze. Uh, it's uh, offline, take some time. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You can record from your computer and hello, it was oh, I see. I see. I would like to ask uh, what I mean with about this, your opinion in the real time analysis. What yeah. I mean with real time? The, the limit? No, no. Uh, what oh. are the limits oh, the of limit. the real time analysis? Of, uh, I mean, informal analysis. In general or in this case? Uh, so, it, because this is completely general. offline. So, you make your recording, you make the analysis, and later you can listen, you can see results, and so on. Uh, real time may be to be uh, useful if you want to see what you are doing during the, your uh, trial. So I am emitting the sustained note or, or something I want to see immediately what happens. We cannot see it with our software. But, so, but, sorry, my question, what, what are the technical the limits? Oh, yes, technical uh, the main limit of our uh, software is that uh, it takes some time to make analysis because the, uh, what we implemented for fundamental frequency, performance, and so on, uh, computation takes sometimes not too much. The largest amount of time is required for 
saving systems, well, several systems, uh, Excel tables, final results, and so on. So uh, that means depends on the computer, but uh, several times seconds. Depends on the length of the frame and uh, Technical limits are due mainly to this. We save many, many uh, of the useful information. You can uh, extract uh, all the values of the fundamental features during the five formats in the site table, make any other kind of analysis you want to do. Um, this first, uh, you can export it. And this is the main reason. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll be fast. Um, thank you for that. Um, it was very fascinating that you said that the F0 and the formant frequency was not a good predictor for the machine learning between distinguishing males to females. Have you ever done that on speech and not no. just for the singing voice? No, no. For for singing, just uh, voices. Just only one. Uh, I just wanted to ask, since you made this comparison, uh, something uh, about the the thinking style that um, the these uh, thinking styles have totally different techniques. So I wanted to ask if I start by classical thinking, can I later go to jazz thinking, or it's going to be like really hard, or they have things in common? Uh, uh, as I told you, I'm not a singer, not a, a singer teacher, but but I can can give you an answer. Some of the I, I, they are not included in the data set that I presented you, but uh, several singers are yeah, both classical and jazz singers, and we make recordings of both sides in the same subject, and they fit perfectly in both. Classical and jazz. So I'm almost convinced that you can learn both sides. Yes. But they can do huh? Yes, yes, they, they can do that. So we continue. We have a very short uh, coffee break. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we're back for the second session, and uh, we have uh, our special invited, uh, Professor Malte Kaldu who is uh, born in Hamburg and he has completed his training as a part-time church musician. He plays the church organ. And um, he has uh, singing and conducting choirs, as well as playing piano, organ, and jazz. Bass, jazz bass, accompanied him during his studies in electrical engineering at the Technical University of Braunschweig, and his diploma thesis on absorption measurement in reverberation rooms at the Physikalisch Technische Budenstandsalt in Braunschweig. That's all people's translation. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's okay. As a research assistant at the Institute for Technical Acoustics at the Rheinisch West. Falische Technische Hochschule Aachen. He worked on the acoustics of musical instruments and received his doctorate in 2001 on the physical modeling of the singing voice. So uh, he has worked a lot for phone phoniatrics, pedodiology, and communication disorders. And since 2009, he's a professor for the theory of music transmission at the Hochschule music that mold, but also since last year at uh, the University of Music and Performance this year, 
uh, University of uh, Music and Performing Arts at the University of Vienna. So um, in national in the international project, he and his team work on the research focuses on the singing voice, music production, and ensemble sound. So thank you very much, uh, Malte, that you're with us. So thank you very much, Nastasia, for the nice introduction. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. I have been um, brief uh, within the framework of the code section, which was on the analysis of the voice, together with Claudia Mantridi and other colleagues, and the Greek colleague was Janis Tejano from the Greek University, speaking voice, but also yeah, any, any voice, really. And uh, so my PhD dates back in 2000 something, 2001 or so. So I have now the chance to uh, Vienna uh, the NDV to enter the field again after teaching tone masters for a while, which are basically musicians with a technical uh, competence. And uh, it is always my goal to try to make physics and uh, physiology understandable to those who use it, but probably don't have much background on the technical side. Um, I think there are two equations that I already apologize for, but they're very simple. So even with full math that you see with uh, results. So what I'm talking about today, uh, I had some agreement with Claudia and uh, accidentally with Johan, and it fits perfectly with your introduction. Thank you very much. I'm now focusing a little bit more on a detail, more or less, and that is about vocal track resonance analysis with two different methods. And one of the methods would be the performance analysis that you're probably aware of by using part and other tools. And with the resonances, very often you talk about resonances in pedagogy and other domains and technicians, they have a very clear idea about resonances. And whenever you talk to somebody, even in biology and behavioral science, everybody has an idea about resonance. So whenever I have the time to do one more habilitation work that will be about resonance, because it's a fascinating issue. There's so many facets that you can spend your whole life on this. And this is a little example of looking into some details. It is not comprehensive, that's not possible. It's more like, uh, and it's not a lecture, it's more uh, throwing together some examples. So, one point where I was working together with music colleges and with people also in singing was that we analyzed the historic recording of voice using Edison's phonograph and other tools. And when we analyzed these certain sounds, we fell upon some problems in interpreting the voice. I, I have very few examples, sorry, but you can see it probably here that on the left, you have a picture of the condenser microphone high quality recording. And on the right, you see a reproduction using a phonograph where the foreman should be the same. So we actually have a phonograph, we used it, we did the recording ourselves. So it was the same thing at the same time recorded with the microphone and with the Edison phonograph. And if you uh, have some experience with formants, you can easily see that there is a problem. Some of the formants, they have disappeared, and some of the formants have appeared out of the nowhere. So what happened here? We were trusting the idea that formants actually are a correlation of your absolute organs and stuff. So we have to look a bit closer here, and what is the reason for that? And that leads us to the understanding of resonances. And what is the resonance? Where does it come from? What does it do? So if you have another attempt, you can say, okay, just let's record again. Now the singer was varying uh, phonation and this different chambers. So it's which singer format without different pitches. And these are just the spectra. So very simple to process and just take the signal to the spectrum. And you can see that even now that we have the same mechanics character, we have a different patient. If we just vary style and fundamental frequency. So what about the form? Form should be something distinct, rigidly coded in our vocal track. So let's go into this a bit more. Um, if you do now an LPC analysis using some software tool and you change the source, then you see that the result of the LPC analysis will vary a lot, even dramatically. That means even if you have the same, in, uh, the same filter, but different input signals, then the output of your analysis will be very different. And it's not a little bit different, it's dramatically different. You would say this is not the same filter, right? But it is. So 
we have a problem with this kind of analysis. So we have to think, what are we doing anyway when analyzing this kind of format? So now I make a little competition. Uh, what who will win, we'll see. Uh, it's formant versus resonance. And we have to see whether they are the same, kind of similar, or are they very different? Are they related at all? So there are many definitions, and I might fall into one trap after the other by doing a definition here. I just do it, and I define formant as properties of the voice signal. That's a general term. But I say if there is no voice, there is no formant. And if you do a voice, there might be a formant. Might be not, but might be. Resonances, however, are more properties of physical acoustic resonators. Now I, I attach resonators to physics and formants to signals. Now you might say, well, that's the same now. Physics, physics, they, they work with signals, all the same stuff. But the signal that you produce can be heard, can be analyzed but it is only present in the air. So it is not linked directly to the physics. It's more something that is radiated to you, you hear it. And that's what we're talking about when we talk about voice signals. So it's the outcome of the system. Whereas resonators are within the system, they are special parts of that system. And they have inherent properties. So they are fixed to the physics. System. And now we can ask some questions. And I'm spoiling, spoiling here. So the one question could be, do all resonances form a formant? So if we say we have some resonances here, would they result in formant? Hopefully, yes, because we need them to analyze and to describe them, also for coding, for understanding. But generally, no. There are some cases where resonances do not form the resonator. We go to the city, uh, the form. And then the other question might be, do all formants relate to one resonance? So that here, formant, is it at least that we can find somewhere a physical part of it that is a resonator? No. That's not so easy. But even there is there some ambiguity. We saw from the first example that we actually don't really know where these things are coming from. No. Of course, that is, I mean, exaggerating, we know, of course, something. So we have to look closer. What about resonators? So resonators are generally understood as uh, from the Latin word resonare. So that means something is sounded out, it comes back, it sounds back, back and forth and back and forth. So you can imagine two walls and sound bouncing between the walls. Very simple assumption, which is essentially not true for all vocal tracks because otherwise it would work close when you see speak. But this is a good example for screens, for example. So open pipes also can be described if we take these walls, not as um, pressure notes here, but for the velocity. So we could imagine that here, if you take the absolute value of the velocity, that must be zero at both ends. And in between, you have lambda half, two lambda half, two lambda half. So they form resonances, and you have a certain order of resonances that forms actually the harmonic to sound. So for pipes, this defines actually. In a very simple view, we can calculate now these resonance frequency with one of the two very simple formulas. Or there are three, sorry. Um, and you can count it to define results. Then, if you close one end and leave the other one open, then you have a similar condition. But now, at the open end, the velocity can be three, so it can be maximum here. Yeah? That must be zero there. So we have quarter at the door, eight length, three quarters, five quarters, and so on. And this now comes close to the vocal track. The vocal track is closed by the glotter. This is mostly closed. Sometimes the vocal track. We saw from Johan that there is this volume flow. And when it's closed, it's closed. It means it's hard wall. So you can say it's also closed. The other end, hopefully, is open. Yeah. Your conductor, you are mostly open. And that means that we can calculate again these frequencies here. And actually, if you do that, sorry. You do that if you put in numbers here, like the length of the box uh, 17 centimeters, speed of sound uh, for the meter per second, then you end up with 500, 1,500, 2,500, 3,500. So this works for the format. Yeah. Now, done. We have the physical properties, we have formants, frequencies, everything, right? 
Okay, we have more. We have thermal resonators. I would like to talk about thermal resonators before thermal resonators in 2020, but I won't. So there's another formula that is good, for example, for whistling and for bottles and other interesting uh, resonators and also for overtone things, but I skip this. Now, if we have these formants, we then can say, okay, fine. We take this very simple uh, relation, sorry for German here, uh, where we have a filter function with this at one, at two, at three, and we have a decaying uh, spectrum here. If we multiply the two, then we find these effects. And by LPC analysis, we can get the maxima of those envelopes here. And these are then called the formants. The higher above F1 to 3 are relevant for two, for example. We know that special feature, overtone thing and others might be usable. And we are formats. Now, I continue with my battle, formal versus resonance. Okay, they're, they're the same, right? Both have corrected frequencies. One of them are called the formant frequencies. We have a nomenclature with is capital F and then the index one to three. Or we have resonances, and there's another nomenclature I would like you to respect this because there was a group of people, worldwide group, writing an article in Gaza where we tried to unify the nomenclature for resonances and performance and for passes and all that. You can look it up, it's a teacher with a lot of colleagues in 2015. So these are then resonance frequencies, and sometimes in physics they're called eigenfrequencies. In other words, like physical special units, which is not translated. And um, both case reasons of amplified sound intensity. That's also true. Um, both can be investigated using theory, as you just did, and also measurement. And both can vary in frequency, in intensity, and also in impact area, so to say, how large they are. Now, that is continuous. There is a good. Why? Performance always require an excitation. They only exist in the signal that you need, you need to excite the resonator or whatever is there to get performance. We cannot analyze them without voice. And it needs to be at the glottal end. Um, we can think of other ways, but this is usually done. Resonances can be identified by using a lot of methods. I will just present one today. And resonances can exist without excitation. So that's interesting. Yeah? It's not as uh, complicated as putting a cat, but it is like the properties of the resonance are within the structure. They are there whether you excite them or not. They are just there. And if you don't excite them, you don't hear them. This is why I said that things have resonances without formants. But um, usually uh, you can have various ways also to excite them. And formants now can be the result of one or several formants. If there are more than one form of uh, resonance involved, then we call this focalization. If two resonances come close, then can give a cheaper form, as we know from the singer's moment or others, other phenomena. So they can be extra strong. And we see, or we saw already, that form analysis can yield very different results depending on the parameters of the algorithm and also where you pick it. Yeah? So it's not just enough to say, oh, fixed set of parameters, always the same result. We have to window our uh, analysis, and I can just give you one example here. I hope it's still in here. Too many windows errors, so. Mm, yeah, right here. So, this is a very, very old program. It's called Colia, and this is uh, written by a French colleague I guess, some ages ago. And here you can see that if you have Examples of vowels. I think I can even play them. Can I play them? No. Ah, very good. Don't well. Okay, now it's done. I don't know if it uses output now. Let's try again. Okay. 
Okay, not very exciting with my own voice. Uh, e, e, o, o. Okay, now I can go here and push a button. And then I see this, hopefully, ah, this is very bad. There should be a violet curve on black ground. Ah, ah okay, almost invisible. Why is it so, it, it's really, really bad resolution. Is there a way to change it? Or can I try? Or... Hmm, I'm not sure if I can change the color easily. Uh, sorry. But um, OK, you have to trust me. When I now click to different places here, then these curves <laughs> look very different. I think I can do something here. I can use some uh, style in uh, just a second. I try something. No. Settings window somewhere. Ah, oh, that's unfortunate. Okay. No. Yeah, but the resolution is more the problem. It should be a two hundred screen. I don't know. I try maybe something. Not sure if it works. But anyway, um. That's right. So uh, you have an analysis, you see these pictures that I showed you earlier. And if I now switch to different fields in the sound here, different places, then they look quite different. They can be jumping 10 or 20 decibels up and down. Or the same signal, which from our audition sounds very similar. So why is that so? And um, yeah, that lies within the problem of interpretation. Because actually what we're doing is, in signal analysis, we try to build a model from our sound. And this depends strongly on the parameters and the inputs. So it is not a very simple task. Now, I want to propose a method that is the acoustic vocal tract impedance at the mouth. So impedance is a term in engineering science which is widely used for several purposes. And the big thing here is it's a non-invasive procedure, so you don't have to put anything into the neck. You can leave the loudspeaker outside, I have here a prototype, looks like this, so you can hang it here, put it to your mouth, and then you can measure the resonances. And the resonances are characterized by so-called impedances. Impedances is the resistance that a sound wave feels when trying to enter the vocal folds and vocal tract. So it goes through the vocal tract and then it resonates, and if it's a um, good resonance that is passing the sound, then you get a, a minimum, and if the minimum of resistance, and if it is going uh, against the wall, so to say, then you have a high impedance. And you can see this from the results. And usually you have to measure for this two properties, pressure and velocity. And here we have a setup that is aged already, but you use a broadband signal, for example, a swept sign, and this is how it looks. So you can attach it to a human, and then you have some tricks, acoustic tricks, for example, you use a kind of horn structure that provides a constant velocity at one input because you need both. Uh, you can measure them with a single microphone, such as a little small thing like this here. And you have to do a reference measurement without a vocal tract, for example, in the free field, just in open air. And then you use some signal processing, some front end, some stuff, and then you can derive this frequency dependent resonance function which is the impedance function. So how does it look like? This is a sequence for the measurements. So you measure without the resonator, then you choose the vowel and the fundamental frequency, so the subject phonates. Then you measure the sound pressure, do an SPL analysis, and uh, if you want the LPC uh, from that signal, then the subject has to stop the phonation. And then it does the excitation of a sweep, like weep, weep, weep. And each of these is then evaluated and you can plot the curves and save the data. Now you might say, hey, what, what, why do you stop? The problem is, if you mix both the voice signal and the impedance response, then you have to separate them later. So for simplicity, you can do it one after the other, but there's a risk. As Johan said, singers are very reliable. They always do the same, but they also always do the same thing wrong. So uh, if they, for example, after phonation, close the glottis, oh, oh, then you measure the closed glottis. If you want to have it half open, you have to ask them to keep it open, ah, which is tricky. 
Yeah, but you can have both and get different results. So just to let you know that it's not so easy as it looks. And what, one example that I was doing, is there's a question in terms of health. <laughs> okay. Um, this is an example of overtone singing. So we did some investigations of overtone singers, and we asked the overtone singer to do exactly that, phonate, interrupt, phonate, interrupt. And we were looking at the results, and what did we find? Usually, you find here a nice formant method. Yeah? For R, for example. But this is an overtone sound. What you see is here, the low ones are not really well represented, but then there is a big peak here creeping on, getting higher and higher. And eventually here you see, oh, it's not one, these are two. Here they separate a bit. So obviously here the overtone singer has not done a perfect focalization, but essentially this is a hint that there's not one form, but two. Not one resonance, but two. And they form this overtone sound. And interestingly, all the other forms that should be around here, they all disappear. Hmm. We had this on the first slide, right? Killing formants. Hmm. So there is a strategy also to suppress formants, obviously, or resonances. Now, uh, we tried to develop something some years ago um, to do the measurement with the uh, voice so that we use also the voice signal and the so-called vocal tract impedance at the mouth was applied here. And then you can have a nice GUI. And then you can compare. Oh, that looks better now. You can compare in the upper plot, you have the regular, uh, oh, sorry, the impedance plot with the two cases with open glottis and closed glottis. And below, uh, below here, uh, sorry, with phonation and without phonation, blue is with phonation and green is without. And below you have the LPC analysis standard algorithm uh, at the same time. And you can see that here, the negative, the minima, they match more or less the maxima of the formant plot here of the transfer time. But not all. So some do a mismatch. This one here is not respected. And there are some others. But we know that according to the order of uh, LPC analysis, we can have any number of, of formants that we want. Yeah? So we can just put in part up the number analysis, and then we get all, all formats that we want. The question is, which are the right ones? And here, the question, of course, is which are the dominant resonances? But this is an alternative to actually uh, the LPC analysis. And it is based upon the real physiology. It is not from the signal. So it even works better if you don't want it. We developed it initially for disabled people with surgery, in the uh, oral area, or even uh, vasectomy of, of glottal, glottal um, parts so, uh, that were trying to relearn speech. And this is also good for singing training. We'll have to talk at soon about training methods. Now, coming back to our week, this, there's something about formants and resonances. So what we have here is now a map where I asked an overtone singer, um, it's Wolfgang, to, uh, Wolfgang uh, Klaus, to sing um, from an R vowel to an overtone sound and then interrupt every few movements with his articulatory organs so that we could kind of have a kind of morphing so transition from the regular wall sound to the overtone sound. And what we can observe that in the lower plot, we can at least see F234 very clearly. F1 is not very well seen here. That is uh, due to the techniques at that time. And we see that here the second format is not moving at all, more or less, but the third format is coming down. And finally, at the overtone sound, it seems to join the second. So that indicate that there is some strategy, obviously, to connect formants and resonances. And the formant that we see in the lower plot could be interpreted as resonance. So it's not as bad as I demonstrated in the battle. There is, of course, a link. Now, one of the questions could be, what do you do as a singer to achieve this? Well, this is an interesting question. I won't do, deal with it today here. But if you want to have details, there was a paper on that in applied acoustics. Now, another interesting sample that uh, was addressed in the question after Johann's talk is why, sorry for the German, I just slided the figure in. Why do we have a problem with the high soprano voices? And Johann just explained, they have two choices. Either they stick to their articulation and get weak. They don't want that. And there's a third way. Uh, another way is they just change the fundamental. <laughs> Usually this is not a very good idea. <laughs> or they could try to adopt the timbre. And that means that they shift the formants. And if they do so, we can get an example here. I can demonstrate, uh, this is from Joe's work, 
uh, there were singing scales. Uh, one singer here, Elodie Jolivaux. Is it on? Good. No, but not, not so strong, no? Huh? So again? Ah, it's me. Yeah, sorry. Interesting. Very good. Okay, try again. So the first scale. La, 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 la. And the second one. Now, if you listen to the first notes, it sounds like this. La, lo, la. All right. And if you now go to the highest one, it's like this. Uh, so obviously they are very close, yeah? So maybe you can guess some differences, but actually they are singing more or less the same sound. That means there is a transition in the scale. And if you look closer, this, this is actually one of the very few publications that went into nature, nature, um, and of course it's amazing. And this is the example here that you can see in nature 2004. I don't know why there's something in front of it. So the LPC analysis that we have here will provide um, these formants that we can find here in the format map. And we can also analyze them now with this impedance method. And they use the similar methods here and they call this R1 and R2 resonances. And you can see the partials here. This is at zero. And as we heard, two times zero, three times and so on. Now the problem occurs when the at zero crosses the first resonance, right? Then we will get into trouble. And that is happening here when this F0 crosses R1. Now here we have R1. R1 is uh, this ballads here for different sounds, hard, hood, heard, and heard. And they actually stay more or less the same until about 600 hertz. And then obviously the strategy of the soprano is to change R1 according to the fundamental and stick with it. So just follow the resonance frequency with the fundamental called this form matching. And this is something that is very dominant, not only in singers, by the way, uh, the Wolf did more examinations on read, read instruments players and others. So everybody does it, obviously. But I wonder whether you know how to do it. Of course, you have to do it to be efficient. But here with these methods, we can measure this and look into it. And I think that's worth the, uh, the paper, even if the effect was well known earlier. So it's not a really recent uh, finding that they are hard to understand. But this is a proof. And it was very nice. So I want to just report how much time do I have left? I think my watch is over or have it? It's over. One minute. We have one, two minutes. Okay. Okay. I just want to uh, tell you about one more project. I won't go into detail, but it's about high, uh, uh, tenor voices. Yeah. And please don't take photos here. This is going to be published uh, just to let you know. And it has not been published and probably never will. But anyway, that's our project. And we had 27 high tenor singers, so count of tenor singers. And we were investigating here with our uh, more elaborate version of the vocal track measurement device here, which looks like a rocket, uh, very bad in these days, but uh, uh, it's an acoustic rocket. At least. And um, yeah, these are the frequency ranges. So they actually could get up, up to 1 to 1.2K, which is quite, a, quite something. And yeah, what we find here with this resonance measurement method is that in some singers, we have a very moderate change in frequencies. And actually, it looks like a performance here in the F1 region or F2 region. And some exhibit this, uh, what we found when seeing the scale. So this is the scale. And this is uh, just a superposition of all the resonance dots. And some do a large variation. So for example, here they split this performance into two resonances. Here we see here the regular position of F1, here of F2. And so sometimes they change it with pitch. And sometimes F3 pops up or not. So this is seems to be a strategy in the register tank. Our initial question was, is there a new register in the counter tunnel or not? This is the question. And yes, you can say, we don't know. So we, in some, yes, some change something. And also it is audible and some don't. 
So there seems to be uh, different levels. And this, for example, is an uh, example of somebody who really changes significantly and also with a strategy. So first, trying to follow here, and then it doesn't work on the week, then they jump up. So there seems to be an articulatory implication of trying to sing as hope high pitches, even in channel voices. And uh, we can follow this by seeing an animation now. We have this pitch change in the spectrum, not in the resonance, just to see if we can also see it in the spectrum. Now you can watch what happens in the superposition. This as the spectrum, and by raising the pitch, you see that the pitch goes up here. But also we cover the formant ranges more or less intensively. Yeah, you can see now how these ranges are covered and how the matching of the formant here, you get the first formant, second formant, is actually not hit by all the partials. And some of them now try to hit and some don't. That is the outcome of this little study here. Okay, so what is the future? Just this. Um, we need the synchronous analysis where we can be sure that the glottal state is known. So just guessing that singers do what they should do is nice to have, but it actually is not necessarily true. So we need to use signal processing. And this is uh, thanks to Mabiba 2021 by Natalie. Um, we have a group there who is working on this software solution to resolve both all the other things. We also need more. So we need to more need to know more about the singing voice features, for example, with endoscopy, voice range profile, EGG, acoustic analysis, and other means, we have to get a more holistic view of the phenomena. It's not enough to just look with one method that's all, almost clear. So I have an idea, and I would like you to maybe team up with me. We want to create in Vienna an uh, encyclopedia of singing voice features that goes down to the very basic things that we can read in any book, but we want to provide it with sound examples, with video, with EGG, with whatever we can have to describe these features most accurately and then put it online. And then you as expert can contribute with singing, with describing, with instructions, with measurements, with whatever. And then that could help us for a further understanding. And that could go international so that we can also think of singing styles of other countries, specialties. In Greek, there are many very local singing styles and that are basically known to the locals, but hardly known outside. So it would be time to open this. So we have the internet, so we could think of it. So that's my dream. And uh, yeah, thanks for all the participants here, of course. And if you want to read something, there's a lot of things to read about it. Uh, <laughs> sorry for the bad quality. If you're interested, I might send you the presentation and you can have a look at it uh, in high quality. And yeah, there are many people actually active in this since a long time. But that's amazing about voice. I don't know how you feel, uh, Johan, but you can spend all your life on voice and you still have to learn something. <laughs> and that's at my age of almost 55, I started to, to go on voice research again after doing my PhD some 20 years ago. But I think that's challenging, but also very uh, rewarding to learn about these things. Thank you very much for listening. lecture. So um, uh, we, if we have some questions, just three minutes, because uh, we're going to continue with Natalie Henrich uh, as uh, she's not able to connect uh, later. And uh, uh, we beg you, I'm sorry, Axel, that you will come later. Okay. So any questions, please, for Malte? Uh, thank you, Malte. Just uh, maybe a final comment. Happy birthday. <laughs> Tomorrow. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. So, cut that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I was just joking. Okay. <laughs>
to say yeah it is actually in between but it depends and that's an interesting finding christine shadel and others have found that the acoustics properties of a vocal track vary with a cycle of formation so if it's closed it's a closed open pipe if it's open it's an open open pipe but the problem is that it changes several hundred times per second yes. so if you want to be fast yeah imagine signal processing if you we have a signal processing guy so if you have to use windows that are of the length of a part of the period then you run into serious trouble that's not going to work so classic methods don't work there are ways to do it yeah it's called pitch synchronous analysis so there are windows that are specially made to analyze it so very deep in signal processing you can get that there are more methods about it. Can we also analyze then the, the vortices in the vocal tract? <laughs> you can ask the right questions. Yes, you can also do this. That's another project that was initiated by Dick Hermes. And the question was whether we can separate auditorily the noise uh, generation in the voice and the harmonic part. And then you need the same tools. Yeah, so this is pitch synchronous analysis. <clears throat> the same tools, the MATLAB tools, I have them if you want to share. Um, that, that is possible. It's very complicated and our audition is very sensitive. It does not necessarily suffice to have the right level. We also have to have the right pace. So the rhythm of the noise and the rhythm of the voice, the voice part must be in an exact phase relation, which is difficult because your microphone is always moving and you're hearing too. And the voice generation of the vortices and the vocal folds is not the same location. They are a little bit downstream. So it's getting complicated, but it's solvable. Yeah. So people work on that and sometimes. Unfortunately, the place of the Kermis, it's the IPO in, in Eindhoven has been shut down. Uh, but uh, these people are still around. Nico Hirschberg, what one of them, I think Dick is also around. So these are available for feedback. Excellent idea to do simultaneously nasendoscopy, dynamic MRI, and this study. You're it. Fantastic. Okay. <laughs> Good. Hands and feet. <laughs> Are we okay? Uh, we can open the connection with Natalie. Okay. So uh, just a moment. If we are okay. <laughs> Thank you very much, Malte. So Natalie Heinrich. Ken Heinrich. Hello, Natalie. Costa. Natalie, do do you hear us? So uh, I hope that uh, we can start, but I just want to make an introduction. And Natalie Henrys is the research director of the French National Center for Scientific Research, CNRS, at the Department of Human and Social Sciences and head of speech and cognition department of uh, GIPSA lab at Grenoble, a choral conductor and singer. She is a scientist with a passion for the human voice in all its forms of expression. Her research projects focus on experimental and clinical phonetics in speech and thinking, on physiological and physical characterization of various vocal techniques, lyrical thinking, contemporary music, world music, on vocal effort in speech and singing, as well as non-invasive okay um, non-invasive experimental techniques for human voice analysis regularly invited to give conferences at national and international levels she is very much engaged in disseminating scientific knowledge about this fascinating instrument she coordinates the world voice day in france uh, animates monthly meetings about science and voice, and she holds a research blog on voice sciences. In 2013, she received the CNRS Bronze Medal for her research on human voice. Her constant wish to have the scientific community communicate with medical and artistic communities has resulted in a collected book 
la voix chantée entre sciences et pratiques, singing voice between sciences and practices, published by Editions de Beck. So, Natalie, no? <laughs> You can chat. No? But it's probably my part. Uh, hi. Hi, everyone. So sorry. Okay. So, um, how can I share my screen with this tool? Uh, yep. I, I will do like this. Um, so now you, you should see my screen. Perfect. And uh, I'm going to move to my presentation. Can you see my presentation? So, um, I'm, I'm so glad uh, to speak with you today about uh, this topic we see, which is a very um, uh, deep in my heart, those filter interactions in the um, Can you still hear me? I 
dulu. Okay, so so please keep your mic on from. No, I I prefer to hear the noise, so I know that you're you're with me <laughs> because I I don't have um video feedback here right now. So um yeah um I wish I could have been with you today, but unfortunately for me, but fortunately for my PhD student, I have a PhD student defending tomorrow in his PhD, so I need to be there for him. As you know, we have the same instrument for speaking and singing, and it's quite common to uh, divide it in three parts. Uh, the briefing part from the first, um, first the, the formatting part and the articulating part. Um, the briefing part will provide the aerodynamic energy to produce uh, a sound. This aerodynamic energy will be converted into acoustic energy and this uh, conversion will be due uh, thanks to interaction within the vocal tract and especially in singing we're interested about the, what happens within the larynx and the interaction with moving walls that we we call vocal folds and all folds within the larynx. This interaction uh, is driven by a complex uh, physics. Uh, we call this, all these physics, we call this uh, fluid structure acoustic interactions because the fluid, so the air, uh, breathed out, uh, interacts with soft tissues and we have a, an interaction between the aerodynamics and biomechanics. And this interaction generates uh, sound sources, uh, aeroacoustic sources uh, that will propagate through the tracts, the supraglottal tract and the subglottal tracts. It will resonate and come to your ears. As you know, in speech and in singing, uh, we have this uh, major uh, theory for explaining how we produce sound. So thanks to this great man, uh, Gunnar Font, uh, we have uh, uh, this framework of the source filter theory. This theory is at the heart of speech sciences and for me voice sciences. It has been applied to speech analysis, speech coding and speech synthesis with great success. It has also been applied to analyzing the synthesis of singing voice, which is uh, one of the main topic of uh, our meeting here. I'd like to come to discuss a little bit this uh, source filter theory. So, as you know, uh, uh, it uh, explains that a voice sound is produced by a source. We can see here. For instance, in time and frequency domain, uh, this glottal uh, flow. This source um, is uh, propagates through a system, the vocal tract, that that is considered to to act as a filter. We have a radiation of, of lip at, at the lips, which is considered as a derivative, and then we have finally out of out of the lips in, in the space the voice signal produced. So this is mainly the framework of the source filter theory. And uh, usually we work on the acoustic output, the voice signal outside of the lips, and assuming some some hypothesis on the source, we can do what we call formant estimation, and and also um, with knowledge about uh, the filter properties, we can come back to the glottal source and do what we call inverse filtering. So let's discuss first what is exactly a formant, because in singing voice sciences, sometimes people use um, different meanings for this, for, for this term. So if we come back to the definition of the American National Standards Institutional Range, 
in which there is an absolute or relative maximum in the sound spectrum. And it's also the way form, font in time uh, defined uh, formants, the spectral peaks of the sound spectrum. So if you come back to my schematic uh, source filter theory here, the formants are obviously with this definition, uh, the maximum in the sound spectrum. However, Font in his time uh, set, wrote in his books that the frequency location of, his, uh, of the maximum of the transfer function, so the resonance frequency of the vocal tract, are very close to the corresponding maximum in, uh, in the spectrum. Conceptually, they should be held apart, but in fact, resonance frequency, formant frequency may be used synonymously. So, for technical applications dealing with voice sounds, it is profitable to define formant frequency as a property of the transfer function of the vocal tract. So, what happened to with this definition of formant is uh, that Gunnar Font, as his, as his time, and now all of us in when working in the framework of source filter theory, we consider that the formants are um, in the properties of the filter. And it will be this definition that I will use in my presentation. So obviously there may be a relationship between formant and harmonics. And so if we come back to, to what Fenn says about it, he says that um, at the first order of, of approximation, the filter function, the vocal tract, is independent of the source. And the formant peaks will only accidentally coincide with the frequency of an harmonic. So where uh, can this happen? If we look at the source signal at a low pitch, so for, for instance, 100 hertz, we have the formants in the trans vocal tract transfer function, and we can see that the second harmonic, third harmonic are boosted by, by the first formant here. If we have a source signal at 300 hertz, which is not a very high pitch for a female voice, and the same vocal tract, we can see that here only the first harmonic may be boosted by the vicinity of uh, the underlying uh, resonance. So, um, the, what what form tells us is that um, the form and frequencies can change as a result of, of an articulatory change, um, but uh, with the limitation of the concept of compensatory forms of articulation, the form and frequencies provide information about the positions of the speaker's articulatory organ. So, what does this imply? When we have a form and frequencies they only depend on vocal tract geometry in this framework of non-interactive source filter theory. So if we have the geometry of a vocal tract and nowadays have 3D MRI image of the vocal tract, um, we can derive the, the area function and from this area function, um, when we apply the linear properties of, uh, of the acoustics, uh, we can we can uh, have calculate the transfer function of the vocal tract, and in this transfer function, we have our uh, form and frequencies. So, with knowing the geometries of the vocal tract, we can uh, establish the vowels which are produced, and it's uh, this renowned um, vocalic triangle that you may know, where we can plot um, the the position of the vowels in this 2D space, the first dimension is the frequency of the first vowel, ranging from 300 hertz for vowel E, U, U, to 800 hertz for vowel A. And the second dimension is the frequency of the second formant, ranging from 800 hertz for vowel U to 2,500 hertz for vowel E. So, this triangle, vocalic triangle, is related to articulatory positions, the degree of aperture, 
we, we will speak about closed vowels to open vowels, and the point of articulation. We will uh, speak about the fact that uh, the sound, the vowel is articulated more in the anterior part of the vocal tract or more in the posterior part of the vocal tract. And this is very obviously demonstrated in this inner visualization thanks to an array of the vocal tract uh, articulatory gestures. So, um, what this source filter theory implies is that we can model this vocal tract transfer function with, uh, without uh, knowledge, specific knowledge on a glottal source. It does not depend on glottal source. And on the opposite, if we want to model glottal source, these models of glottal source will, will not vary with the vocal tract. So there, there is a, a, a linear model, and so no, no dependency between tract and source. However, if we come back to the physics and the, its complexity for producing a voice sound, we see that um, there is this uh, strong coupling between air, tissue, and uh, acoustics. And in fact, when we sing, we know that we are always uh, playing on this interaction between our, uh, our breathing gesture and our phonatory gesture, and also on, on this interaction between our phonatory gesture and how we, we adapt the vocal tract uh, properties, not only geometrical properties, but all, all its aspects. So now I will I will speak about these source filter interactions that we can evidence. So first I will speak how, how the filter have an impact on the source. There are two level that uh, in this interaction first is level one. It was labeled by Ingotidze. It's uh, how the sub and supraglutal tracks have an acoustical loading on, on, on the source. So here you have a, a representation of this uh, uh, acoustical loading by Martin Rothenberg uh, already uh, 30 years ago. That shows that uh, even if glottal area has a symmetric shape, the fact that uh, you have an acoustical loadings on the source uh, induces the glottal pulse to be skewed, and it will be skewed uh, even greater to the right, the, the contact being uh, faster than opening on glottal pulse shape, if it's, uh, if it's more innovative. The, the shape of the vocal tract, here the supraglottal uh, vocal tract, has also uh, an impact of the impedance function as seen from the source. And you can see here that uh, if you change uh, the vocal tract from no interaction to an interaction with several shapes, uh, you will have a modification of several uh, source parameters, so, such as, as a MFDR, uh, the skewing caution, or the peak flow. If we have uh, performance that are very close to uh, the fundamental frequency of oscillation, of, of, of glottal oscillation, you will have uh, uh, you will have some um, ripples that will be found uh, on the estimated um, uh, inverse filtered uh, glottal flow. So maybe some of you are familiar with, with this aspect. If you, if you want to do inverse filtering on signals where the moment is close to first harmonic, that, that can be very tricky. Uh, let's move from this level one interaction to level two interactions. Um, I used to work uh, with a database of uh, many uh, professional seniors, and I measured uh, their open cushion values. So the open cushion uh, is the duration of uh, glottal open phase over 
the duration of the glottal cycle, so a fundamental oscillation period. So if I want to measure this open caution for several vowels, I can. I asked these singers to produce the, the sustained vowels for a given pitch and given loudness. And here I plot um, uh, the vowel, uh, one vowel in front of the other. So for instance, here on, on the first plot, here on the top, top left, it's vowel U for X axis and the corresponding uh, vowel A for Y axis always the open question values for these vowels at same pitch and loudness. So we would have expected the open question values to be found on, on, the, on, on the line y equal x uh, if there were no effect vowel on open question. But in reality, for many seniors, we observed that um, this open question value, value for the same pitch and loudness was greater uh, in, um, in vowel R as compared to vowel U, for instance, which is evidence here for several baritones, contratenors, and also for a mezzo-soprano. So this, this uh, effect tells us that when you have a modification inside the vocal tract, it is reflected on uh, glottal parameters, such as uh, the open caution. Uh, we worked specifically on the impact of uh, glot uh, supraglottal constriction, and here you can see on, on this cut that we have the vocal folds that are renowned, but we have additional folds uh, above the vocal folds. And here we are interested in what is known as false vocal folds or ventricular bands or vestibular folds. These vestibular folds, they are used in singing for many um, uh, singing expressions like crescendo, decrescendo, yodel, roomy singing, sardine and polyphony, human beatboxing, hard work, metal work. And you can use this the folds to produce um, sounds that are very low, perceived as, as very low in pitch. I've played a sound, I hope you heard it. Um, so maybe it's because I, I shared the screen, but maybe the, the audio is not shared. Um, ah. I play it again. You can't hear the sound? Ah, okay. Um, is there, is there a, 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 when I, I stop the sharing, maybe when I do the sharing, there is a button I should, uh, I should, uh... okay, otherwise that's not a problem. I will uh, re remove, remove my audio and, um... And maybe you will hear from my, from my, um, it, it does not ask me to share. Let's see. Uh, can you see my, my presentation again?
Okay, can you hear me well? Can you hear me well? Okay, so so now if I move this. Have you heard the sound? Okay, also I can I consider you cannot hear the sound. That's okay. No problem. So um, we, for producing this very low pitch sound, you have um, an intervention of the vestibular folds. And uh, this uh, contribution of the vestibular folds um, directly impact the vocal fold contact and can be recorded through uh, physiological signals such as electroglottographic signals and its derivative. So we conducted experiments on this uh, from an aerodynamical modeling point of view, and also we explored in vitro uh, this, um, these aspects. And what we showed is uh, that uh, if we reduce um, the, the gap between uh, the ventricular folds, so getting here at 20, the ventricular folds are uh, really um, uh, far away from each other. And when we go to zero, the ventricular folds are getting close and close. There is here a region where the, the ventricular folds are moved apart and there is no uh, alteration on vocal oscillation. But when you move slightly the vocal folds close to each other, the ventricular folds, close to each other, there is a zone where the vocal fold oscillation is favored. So it's helping vocal fold oscillation to narrow the vestibular fold, the vestibular tube. However, if it's too narrow, if the, the ventricular folds are too close to each other, then the glottal oscillation will be altered. So we have re here a, a level two interaction in the sense as a slight modification within vocal tract will strongly impact the glottal source. So let's move to the uh, last part of my talk, which is to see, we've seen how the, the filter, so the, the vocal tract articulation can modify the source. We'll now briefly see how the source can impact the filter. And I will start with what, what I call level zero interaction because it's not exactly interaction that are not taken into, a, into the source filter theory, but it's a adaptation from, from the singer. If you ask a singer to sing the low, the mid and the high pitch for uh, three vowels here are, and U, you can see that at low pitch, the articulatory gestures for producing these three different vowels are very different from each other, whereas an, at high pitch, there is slightly no change in, in the position of, of, of the tongue, for instance, which is one of the main articulators.
né? of the voice that has been integrated into numerous professional audio tools. And he has recently started to investigate signal processing algorithms based on deep learning. Thank you very much, Excel. Thank you, Ivan. Thank you, Ivan. It's a pleasure to present our work. Uh, maybe I make a little comment in the beginning. Uh, yes, you heard a lot of things about uh, physical models, signal models. So we also work on these kind of questions in our team. The animal team we work only on single models, not on physical models, but we have other teams that work on, on, on physical models. So we have seen or heard that it's very complicated to understand what is happening in the world. And in fact, in our team, the, the, the question is basically, Composers or artists come and say, okay, I have to avoid and I want it to change. So there is a signal and we need to interact with the signal. And so we need to establish parameters that allow to change different things the, uh, the uh, artists or composers may want to change. So, for example, identity, uh, genre, so text, yeah. and uh, pitch, uh, loudness, uh, vocal loudness, as we heard also. So all these parameters, and, and you, you need to know how, what did you do with the signal uh, so that it that changes these features. And in fact, that was proven to be very difficult. We tried this until 2015, and we told you a few results. And after this, then we said, okay, we do a network. The idea is we don't really investigate individual signals. We did the, the model a large number of Samples, and from these examples, the model will then find the, the neural, model, neural network model will find a, a way to represent the different features that you can then interact with so that the model changes signals. This is the basic idea. And I will give you here, we, we are not finished with it, so we have first uh, results, and I will show you a few of them. Uh, uh, and this is the context of, of this research. So, uh, the talk, uh, I give you a thought. So we, I did talk about two projects in fact, the Shanti project that was uh, until 2017. In this project, we worked on singing synthesis and style modeling. And then the art project uh, that is currently ongoing still, where we work on analysis of singing style with deep neural networks as well, uh, as well, uh, singing style with deep neural networks, but also interaction for changing of singing voice with deep neural networks. So a short mention of uh, the uh, the project, so the old project, here is the singing uh, synthesis system that we built in this project, comes in with a score, then we have a database of recorded singing, the, the singer is asked to sing a constant pitch, all sorts of uh, words, so that we have a, a database of the, all diaphones of French language are present, so that then later we can, if there's a new uh, text that is presented, we can just select the correct diaphone and we concatenate them, 
not the signal, we call that a parametric representation of the signal, and then the parametric representation that we can also impose uh, information contours or loudness changes. And so this is the So, uh, 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 so there's the control module. So we have the scores. Uh, on one hand, we get the we get the uh, points and, and the diagrams that we need, and then we have the control module that translates the score into uh, contours of parameters, uh, the loudness and the intonation parameters, and also the duration of the different points. So the control module uh, that was the topic of the series of Lick Arda Young. And you can read the series online, and then he describes how he controls all these parameters. That is on how which, what kind of representation of these parameter controls is so, so that we can control them. That's not so much the topic of this course. Here I wanted to show you how we got the uh, signal, the style model. So we asked um, a few a few singers. Uh, no, sorry. A few recordings from uh, well known singers, there's Eddie Piaf, uh, Zata Dicke, Juliette Greco, and Francois Leroux. And so we tried to extract what these people did when they sang songs. And we had given, obviously, we cannot ask them to record for us. So we had the songs with the background music. And so the musicologist in this project, uh, Celine um, Sabocane from Lyon, uh, she mostly, so we had some rough free analysis and then we had to fine tune everything by hand so that we found the locations of the phonemes, the intonation contours and the loudest contours from this from these mixers and this is we went then into uh, the different three models that would say the musicologist would have said okay for a musical style model you need these kind of context so for example pitch of a note duration of a note the duration of the neighboring nodes, the intervals between these node sequences, and with all this, we feed uh, the uh, decision tree to get what we have observed, observed in, these, uh, in these performances. And then the model came out with what are the most relevant contexts. For example, here for Elysia, we, we find some of the contexts that were most interesting for the model to select the parameters here for uh, Vibrato. Uh, I think it's about the frequency or the rating. And you see it's different for the different singers. That's already interesting because it means different singers will change their styles differently according to the same context. Here is the averages. This is history. So we got, I just want to show you what comes out of that. So this is, for example, it is a song, an original song. So then the, our uh, synthesis model that we developed uh, with a, a kind of a default singing style. And here we have then applied this model that we extracted from Elysiac recording and applied it to this uh, same song. So you, you, you hear the different parameter selections that you did for the vibrato and uh, according to the position in the score and the, the, the surrounding uh, musical context. Okay, the main problem here was, uh, as I said, there was a lot of manual work uh, to annotate all this. And um, so the next project was then, that was the ask project. The idea here is that we want to use the uh, deep neural network and the deep learning, machine learning approaches to extract these kind of styles, models. So the musicologists, they want to study all sorts of music uh, that they can collect from commercial recordings. And uh, they don't want to invest, invite 
different system for them because then it's not the, the same context. It would not be the same style. And additionally, I have shown you the example from our ISIS uh, singing synthesis. You hear that the voice somehow sounds a little bit not so natural. The main problem here is that you have recorded everything as on one pitch, as I said, and then if you try to change the pitch, the fact is that a singer changes many things if you change the pitch, and these many things that you change in its uh, physical uh, vocal apparatus, uh, you don't really know what you have to tune in uh, the singer to, to reflect all these things. Even if you have a physical model, you would not know this because you can not very easily invert the signal to find what, was, what were the parameters that were changed. So here the neural networks are supposed to learn that themselves and to, uh, so that if we change, we say change the pitch, then it changes all the other parameters together so that the singing voice becomes uh, convincing. Uh, now the different results that we have obtained so far, uh, one of the first uh, questions was, can we extract the singing voice from the recording? And uh, I, I don't know whether you follow this, but I mean, the singing voice extraction models have made a big progress. So it, it's pretty uh, convincing now. Um, so we implemented one of these. Here this, these are the results of the last competition in uh, Where There is one uh, model that is provided by a company. So we, we don't really know how it works, it, it created, I give you a number, series to distortion, so that means the error that was in the signal compared to the uh, output energy, is about 10 dB. And then there is from Facebook, hybrid uh, VMAT has 1,000 million, so one giga of parameters, 90 dB uh, vocal distortion. And um, that means the, the more signal to distortion, the more the higher is better. So this is a left good. And here is one that is pretty cheap, only 10 million parameters, and then uh, it has also 9 dB of a vocal distortion. So we thought in our lab, we are not Facebook. That means we don't have huge parts of the GPU and the computational power. We also want that our models can be used in all, for all the production at that time. That means uh, composers, they sit in front of a little computer and they want to run this. And so that means we need small models that are very efficient. And so we started to use uh, with this one, and we implemented it, and then we trained it. And it's, it's pretty interesting. We, we have some history with this. There, is a, there are a few databases where you have music, and then you have the vocals separated. So the system can train your model to extract the, uh, the singing voice. There are about 150 songs, which is not a lot. And uh, there was a lot of work going on to see how can we, with the same database, uh, increase variability so that the model works better for new song. And uh, it turns out the best thing you can do is you mix randomly voices with instruments. That means they are no longer related. There's no harmonic relation, no temporal relation. Still, the neural network works best because it has seen more uh, variation. And so we uh, created our database, we added more songs, we had uh, singing voice recordings, unrelated to the music, to the background music, so the model learns better if we train with this. I'll give you an example here. This is uh, the small model with 10 million parameters and 9.3 uh, dB we have here. So this is an example. I'm a racing car. I'm a racing car, passing by like a driver. I'm gonna go, go, go. I can tell that you know it. But then you wake up like a, and I can tell that you know it on how I want it. Well, maybe I'll step there. So the uh, musicologists, they want to study these, uh, these pieces, uh, Ariana Grande, that's uh, currently very uh, on road, so, and uh, so we can now separate the music out, and then we can, that means we can then, for example, run our classical SEO estimation algorithm on top of this to see what were the information contours that, that, we, uh, that we used. 
And so there are two words on this. We had also worked for 15 years on uh, at zero estimation algorithm. Swipe is not our work, it's here from Samatu in 2008. One of the main problems with these things is they, they, they never really work. So they work for signals that are more or less standard, but they rather quickly don't work anymore if you have something that is not so normal. Uh, here's an example. Let me... uh... And so the, the zero estimation you see normally the fundamental is here. And the algorithm always jumps to the strongest harmonic. Not always, but, uh, and so it's basically useless. And these kind of uh, problems, usually you need to see parameters. You need to say, okay, search in this area, and then it will burn. But I mean, if you have enough data base, then you cannot do this. And uh, so it should be automatic. And there was also the idea, now, can we use neural network for that? And in fact, from the start, we cannot. Because there do not exist any databases where you have a reliable at zero estimation annotation. Taking because if you would have it, it would mean we had an algorithm that did it. And uh, so the idea here was um, also work of Luc Abayon after his thesis. The idea was we, we take the algorithm that we had that I have shown you in the ISIS program with the pulse and noise recorder, and we analyze speech. We only get this with speech. We analyze speech. We change the parameters. The parameters are maybe not correct. Still, we use the same parameters to resynthesize speech. Then we have a speech signal that is perfectly correlated with the, uh, with the parameter. So we had an intonation contour at the start. It generates speech. And then we can use this speech that we generated to, to predict the zero estimation or the zero contour. And that is at least perfect. So we did that. And the idea was that for this model, we don't have any parameters. So it should work from where I say uh, 30 to 1,000, it turns out it works from 50 to 700. It is already quite nice without any parameters. Uh, so we use here for the data by 15 hours of speech, 600 features, uh, the model, we transpose. So we, during the recent synthesis, we also transpose, we, we, we uh, transpose by uh, one of class up and one of class down. We just have a larger, because in speech, we don't find uh, 700 hertz. So we need to, to transpose artificially. And that gives us then our database on that we train this model. It's just the convolutional model. Mm. And uh, then we compare the results and we find that uh, this thing, the model here, this one, uh, is much better than all the others we had before. And it's also very fast. I mean, it's very small. It runs on the, on the CPU uh, much faster than real time. So that means we have a very small, rather small latency. You see 60 milliseconds. The, the version we had before had 128 milliseconds, so the signal processing algorithm. So that's nice. And here we come back to our baritone that we had in the beginning. You see this was white. And this is now the model that we trained on speed. Never saw any, anything, and still it nearly perfectly finds the fundamental. And here's a little mix, but OK, it's not perfect. But so this algorithm now, we use it for everything, for all kinds of, uh, of speech and singing. I just read an article in, in uh, a medical school. They, they compared many of the estimation algorithms for, for voices, pathological voices. And they found that this algorithm works best compared to all the others. Not for voicing detection, for voicing detection is not inside here. So they had one algorithm for voicing detection. I think it was Google Lisa. And uh, this algorithm uh, was the best, or one of the best, I mean, they have different for, um, for the information. So that's pretty amazing, but it never saw any such a version of voice. Voice alignment, so that is then uh, another problem. We need to find where are the phonemes in the singing voice. That is the PhD series of Jan Teto, who is currently uh, uh, finishing the PhD. So the problem, I mean, this is particularly obvious. We want to find uh, the, the, the phonemes or the syllables or the words in the singing voice. Uh, there are many algorithms existing that HMM, normally these are SMN models, 
very often there are language models inside. So that means if you go to a new language, you need to change more or less everything. For our argument, the idea was that was we don't want to have language depend language knowledge inside because we don't work on language. Uh, so the, with our ISO system, for, the, for example, term, we work only in French because we don't have an alignment that can align other things in French. So now with this new system here, we are supposed to be able to align whatever comes. And uh, it appears to work quite well. I will show you a few examples. The overall organization, we input the audio, with the male frequency spectrum and to input somehow also the lyrics. Then the model classifies the audio into uh, phonetic classes. So it says in this frame, you have the frame here, so this is frequency, time, and here it's phoneme class, time, and you see it classifies. I mean, this is a little bit idealized, uh, it's not obviously so, uh, so perfect, but it, it proposes the classification, and then later, we, with the task of phoning that we know, we know because we know the lyrics, we just search here, it is uh, time and uh, time, and so we search the, the, the phoning probability. We go here and, and search the path that best, uh, with most uh, large, uh, with highest likelihood, uh, finds the sequence of phoning. So this is the general idea. And this was one of the big problems because this alignment thing is quadratic and it, it, uh, it's for very long songs. Uh, you cannot hold this in memory, at least not in a, on a GPU because they are either very expensive or they have not so much memory. So we found an algorithm that allows to do this without this memory explosion. And this is our final model here. It's also fully convolutional. That means we can train it on 10 seconds, 10 second examples. Where we only know, need to know this is the audio and this is the text inside. We don't need to know where in this audio are the text for training. We just need to know in this audio segment there is this sequence of characters and the 10 second slot we train the thing. And because it's convolutional, then we can apply this to even hours. We tried it here with three hours and it uh, still has a median uh, alignment error of 40 milliseconds, which is pretty good. And it, for, for speech, we trained it on English and French. And it works even on German, on Chinese, because there is silence inside. So for the word, it was word alignment. There is silence, and these silences are everywhere in all languages. And because the silence is important for the word alignment, finally, it, it is for speech at least, uh, even for slang. I want to make a short demonstration here. This is going to go on how to go back out of this. To show you the the results on two cycles. So that was one song provided by our musicologist. So you find here the song, and you see alignment uh, that was found by this algorithm, and that is so maybe yeah. you look. Play. Look at that face, you look like my next mistake, loves the game, wanna play, no money, student die. So, it is not perfect, the musicologists still do have to align more precisely in phonemes, but it's a much better starting point than we had before, and you hear here also the expected voice, so that's already Expected from the background movie. Maybe uh, a case where it doesn't work so perfectly. So this is Charles Asman Wood. So he wanted to make it a paper on Charles Asman Wood, so he provided the database of the uh, uh, singer. And in fact, here we may have a little problem with the separation already. So, the separation did not expect the saxophone. So, the saxophone, in fact, in the database that we had, there were not so much saxophone. The saxophone is also rather close to the voice. And so, it keeps the saxophone in. 
interestingly, the alignment algorithm, it is, our alignment algorithm currently is not working on separated voices. It turns out it's better. We, we, we let it work on the music, complete with background. And we see here, it also put words into the saxophone. So it means somehow it has the same confusion. It, it finds it aligns words. So this is one problem to saxophone. Now, as I said, we can randomly mix music and voices. That means we can just take saxophone and mix it into our into our training, and then the the, the model they also learn to expect saxophone. Uh, that is one of the next steps. So here I can also play a little bit. Mais lorsque tombe la nuit, que tu viens dormir près de moi. Okay, so I so far the alignment. So this, this is a thing for the musicologist. Um, the idea is after the end of this process that the, all these algorithms are put on the web page and that interested musicologists, they can submit audio, it will be separated, it will be, you would need to submit audio and lyrics, and then it would be separated and it would be aligned and you would get back all the information controls, and then you can use this for your own study. I mean, I don't know whether too many visitors here, but it could be interesting. So the next point then is, uh, can we use neural networks also to transform the same singing voice and um, there the first question was, um, what is the representation of voice that we could use to condition to tell the neural network what it could think? And uh, we first thought about all these parameters that we usually use, like SEO, uh, sexual envelopes, vocal track filter, uh, noise level. And um, the problem is that, for example, if you use the zero, then if you want to change the zero, and you know you want to change all the other parameters as a function of the zero, that means the neural network needs to find these correlations between these parameters, which are not very easy to connect because I mean, you don't really know the envelope, uh, what the, they have different units, and uh, so they are not similar. And so this looks to be the, the first the start of the set, but it finally, because it's not such a good idea. We then learned about the net spectrogram. In speech synthesis, nearly everybody now uses the net spectrogram as input. For me, that sounds very strange because in the next run, you know, there is not much information. You would say it's not sufficient. Uh, it turns out for speech synthesis, next spectrum is sufficient to reproduce speech nearly perfectly. So we cannot make the difference between real world speech and the speech that we, that we got from this next run. So uh, I started here this, this investigation with the, the next run, we can uh, reproduce. And to what extent we can reproduce all the different effects that may happen, I mean, in, in singing voice and in speech. You see, in, in, in protective speech synthesis, I mean, it's quite natural, it's quite a normal voice, it's very calm and uh, not very expressive. And the question is whether all these parts of expressivity that, that may change the uh, expressive voices, whether we can represent it with only presenting the next section one. So the, the model here that uh, I thought we introduced is something like a mixture between signal processing words and neural networks. There are parts, in fact, the yellow part, are all parts that are signal processing operators, and the green parts here that are parts that are neural networks. And so, for example, we get the net spectrum in, and then there's first neural network that, that predicts what is the zero we could and then there is a signal processing module that generates a sign little signal, not necessarily sign and sign and little, but a periodic signal, and adds some noise. And this is then input in, this is somehow the source. So we are back into the source data model. We heard it from, from uh, Natalie. This is source, and then there's a neural network that transforms the source to create something like a global pool. Where we don't say what is the water pool, but 
but it has this function because afterwards here there is the vocal truck filter predictor that filters uh, what comes out of the equation to create the final model. So in fact, we have again a source filter model, and this is also very small, so it's faster than real time, uh, and uh, I will probably show you uh, later how, how fast it is. The source filter model then, so we have structure, source generator, vocal truck filter generator, but the, the neural network, in fact, does not really do what we want it to do. The vocal track filter that it produces is not a vocal track filter that you would expect if you would do analysis of a real, of a real uh, voice sound with uh, the ATC, for example. Um, so it has, it takes some, some freedom to fix things around, to fix some parts of the thermal and uh, the filter into this network, but more or less it keeps the structure and then it comes out here uh, as the signal. So I'll give you a few examples of uh, what is achieved. Uh, yeah. Here is uh, 45 hours of, of uh, speakers with 150 uh, different speakers. Um, for speech training and singing, it's uh, 27 hours of singing with 136 singers that we collected on the internet uh, in French Japanese in text here. And then it is only using sense. I don't go too much into the detail. You have you have two examples. What comes out of the wave net after the the, the the source generator? You see, it is not completely white. Here it's, uh, there are some resonances here, uh, which are related to the post-processing with the PCM net filter. But still, I mean, it, it's not perfectly white. You see here, there, for example, uh, it, it's not what you would normally expect as a source, but uh, on the other hand, here is the vocal track predictor, the filter. That compensates them, and these two together, they they turn out to be very good. You see also here, in the vocal track, normally you would not have quite high pitch. By the way, the last word is here, the predicted at zero, that was used to generate the final uh, source. Here you see that there is a performance on the uh, on the resonance everywhere on each part. So that could not happen normally. Um, but also there, I have constrained the model to not do this. It turns out afterwards to become less good. So I let it do. And um, fine. Here we have a few examples of quite extreme uh, voices, just conditions on the main set we want. So I here to original. Il l'autre avec sa chandelle dans la vieille chambre. So we have a lot of noises. It is pretty difficult to, to model normally with uh, the speech model. And here's the reason to this. Il l'autre avec sa chandelle dans la vieille chambre. So the model perfectly combines all the things just having seen the mass spectrum. And in fact, the mass spectrum that we provide goes only up to 8 kilohertz. And everything that is above is the free extension of the neural network that says, okay, for this, if I need to generate up to 10 kilohertz uh, or even 12 kilohertz, I have to extend so that it becomes natural. There's a little problem. I don't know whether you can hear that. It should be probably here. So here there are subharmonics, and these subharmonics here are translated into noise. This is a little uh, uh, systematic problem in, in the, the model that I've shown you before. The, the way the FU is generated does not allow to have the fade in of subharmonics that you see here, and that's why the, the model, uh, no, there. And that's why the model translates this to something that it can uh, generate, which is noise. And there we are uh, also currently working on to see how we can extend the, the model to make this happen again. Um, that, that was on the speech. We have also examples you know, that of text. Here we are, have example, I, I hope I'm, I am not online. So there's singing voice, it works basically the same. 
and uh, it's also got the different languages. So we have uh, generated sign rules, channels. I did, did never see that. So because there's so much structure in this model, it allows to generalize to other languages because there are never the sounds that are similar. And uh, so that's now. Now the question can we transpose this? How can we uh, save this model? Now we want another pick. And uh, this is the work of my PhD Frederick Wood, who's also currently uh, finishing his PhD. Contact all the PhD you can find them probably at that time. At some point, they will get to online in the beginning of the next year for the, the defense. So we have the med pack one. And uh, now we want to put the med pack one in and we want to tell the model now generate me the med pack one that has the same phonetic content, the same speaker or singer, but has a different thing. And uh, so now the, the interesting thing is that the med pack one is just an image. And image processing, you may have seen that on the internet, if you know, the network, there's quite a lot of things that, that work very well. So we, I just give you an example here, uh, the input, and then you can say, okay, produce me this kind of haircut. Uh, no, sorry, this is eyeglasses, sorry, yeah. So here it readily adds eyeglasses. Uh, and here it, it readily adds the, the haircut. So you see that that it uh, not only adds eyeglasses, but it also changes the rest of the, of the, the face so that the eyeglasses merge perfectly into a, an image that is, that is convincing, that is natural. And so the idea is the same. We want to impose another zero, and the model should adapt the left cycle so that the whole is, again, a singing voice that is, that is natural. And this is the idea here. The system works like this. Uh, we have the med factor one that goes in. We pass it, we produce the same med factor one. Uh, so the loss is we just compare the input to the output. But here there are two blocks of neural networks that force the med factor one into a code that is pretty small. So here in the middle, med factor one has 80, frame, uh, 80 bins per frame. And here in the middle, it has only 10. So it needs to recode the med factor one. It's throwing away things, and then from the 10, the decoder is tasked to reproduce the original net background. Obviously, that will not be possible, but there's a trick. We pass it, we have zero here. We tell the decoder, okay, you don't have all information here, but you get the zero here. Take the zero from here, take the rest from there, and reconstruct the net background that is the same at the beginning. So what the network learns is it removes all information that is related to a zero, from the mesh factor one in this code. And then it takes the zero and completes what it finds in the code. So in the code, there should be speaker identity, phonetic content, maybe noise level, displaying and, and dirtiness. And so combine this with the zero to reproduce the same thing. And that's pretty amazing. It never saw any transposition with it. It only learned to reconstruct the origin. And with this, then we can tell it, okay, now you have trained, learned that. We just want it to do the same thing, but use another F0. And that means then it will produce a med factor one that has all the other features. That's the series. It has all the other features and um, has a different F0. Now, um, I just told you it works to some extent. Here we go. If I go over here. Uh, here is an example. So in this software here, that is by the way also available on the Icon forum. You can try this. It doesn't cost you just need to uh, subscribe to the forum. You have uh, an original voice. I go to This is the next one that, that we put in. Uh, unfortunately, I, I did already some things and I cannot really reset to the beginning. Let me see. I will just play. Tu vois aucun filmant dans tes seins, toi. Avoir la vie partagée, ça y a des. So here we have the original as well, the transformed as well, which was uh, input, and 
no, the content that we will get to model generated and the target that we will get to input. So here we can say, okay, hit me that higher, one will send up. Okay, Do I have the time to read that the thing? Ah, okay, so anyway, it's the, it's the end. So you know, this is the beginning. Let's uh, use this again. Et voir aucun filament en entier ça. No, I can pull here. You see the target has the same. And uh, no, I can pull. Well, change the next cycle on the bottom. And you see that the blue was the original appeal. The target is the orange at zero, and now the green at zero after confirmation has aligned with the target, not perfectly, because it's in the network. And especially in the in the in the context. Et voir aucun film en entier ça à toi. Avoir la vie partagée, ça y est bien. So we can go uh, higher. Et voir aucun film en entier ça à toi. Avoir la vie partagée. So at some point, because the thing I never sang that high, at some point the model decides I know I will shift the voice. I mean, have the other example, it will, will be another finger. Uh, and then it becomes a little bit uh, shaky with the argument it could preserve the finger that we had in the bottleneck. But here you see, so, so there is the the mail inverter running here, and there's also this model that translates the zero running at the same time, and you see it's faster than real time, even here with all the people. I can go even higher, and at some, at some point it will break. Yeah, at some point, it would probably not sufficient, be sufficient to, uh, to only train a reconstruction. So it cannot be going the other way. I mean, I wanted one example because you made uh, one make uh, these examples with um, vocal, vocal loudness. Let's see the vocal effort is inside them. In fact, that is uh, something. Uh, Let's see, I hope it feels good. So that could translate the vocal effort to be stronger. In fact, the, the problem here is that we did not record any examples with stronger and less strong vocal effort, only in order that our, our database we instructed the model to reconstruct the correct vocal effort. After, after us having removed it from the mesh cycle one by just um, normalizing the average mesh cycle one. So it had the effort to the, the target to predict what was the right vocal effort, just seeing the vocal, the mesh cycle one without that we removed the energy. So just from the spectral slope, it, it would conclude, okay, with this spectral slope, the vocal effort for this feature was probably there. And then it predicts uh, the, the output both the effort that we could use and the this input then can also reconstruct the, the complete uh, net second one. So in the system, we can uh, shift this a little bit. We have here the vocal effort display. You see the original vocal effort predicted from the net second one is blue. 
uh, the, the orange again about the target and the green is what it did. And so I hope you remember still the original. Et voir aucun film en entier, ça à toi. Avoir la vie partagée, ça y a été. We can go also in the other direction, minus two dB. So here, I mean, uh, I didn't notice, but I think now the zero is much stronger. Et voir aucun film en entier, ça à toi. Avoir la vie partagée, ça y a été. So it, it starts to work, but uh, there's still a lot of uh, things to do. Sometimes it, it uh, does not preserve exactly the phonemes. That is a little bit of a problem. Sometimes the intonation is not perfect. So there also we have to tune a little bit that it, that it follows more closely the intonation we, we want it to have. But uh, overall, it's already quite a good thing. Thanks a lot for the uh, attention. I would like to ask again about the possible real time application of the CNN model uh, for the zero detection. If it can be to work real time and, and consequently, if we could apply the real time, the uh, uh, So, yeah, uh, basically, that, as I said, that uh, the latency is about 60 milliseconds. We cannot change this. Too much. I mean, if you are fine with 60 milliseconds, we can also obviously we can retrain the thing with a, with a little less latency. Uh, by the way, also for the singing voice transformation, we are currently investigating to retrain it. Currently, we see the next that you are in the future and the next that you are in the past. Not very much, but a little bit. It is not so good for real time, but we can also train it with only providing the next that of the past. And then it, it would uh, work, work on real time, and the same would happen with uh, could happen with the zero. Uh, that would be possible in, in, in principle. Uh, generally, that creates a little degradation. Degradation. It will not be as good. And uh, we can also, yeah. And, and as I said, we didn't study yet to what extent it uh, degrades. For the thing, one thing, uh, the PFC team already has made a version uh, in real for real time. It still works. But uh, um, yeah, so this we need to study this. But in principle, it's possible. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, I think that's all right. Thank you. I don't know all the logic. Maybe it's going to work out. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, if I understand well, you can uh, remove the background noise somehow from background noise. I mean, 
uh, in many biomedical applications, we record voices uh, with uh, some background noise, uh, um, environmental noise, uh, something like that. And we, of course, would like to have just the voice recorded. Is it possible to remove, uh, not music, <laughs> but background noise, just the noise? Or no, not consistent because it was very Okay. Okay, you have master filter database. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. So you mean if I build a database with your software, we can yeah, distinguish, so uh, extract the voice or separate. Oh, I see. Of course, and then okay. And the second question, so uh, is the same uh, answer if we want to uh, um, separate two voices that are that overlap. Maybe the, the, the clinic, the clinical the clinician speaks, and the patient. At the same time, of course, we want to know just the patient. You have this one, you could train the network to just the music. You have a group of doctors that you that you So that could be then more of the same system. But there are six other systems that can operate create encodings of the speakers that are present, and then we can say, okay, I want this speaker and I want that. So this is more complicated, but it's possible. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah? Okay, so thank you very much, Excel. <laughs> Bravo for. And it's very important that um, they come, the scientists are working also with the quality systems uh, composer. So they're doing a very nice research. The tools, the software that they use are really for on the point. Very important. So uh, we have just uh, 10 minutes. So we cannot uh, go further to the round table. But uh, I would like to say that today we had. Uh, Five uh, keynote speakers. Graham West will join us tomorrow. So we had uh, this very, uh, very important and uh, uh, researchers and professors uh, on the analysis and synthesis of the human voice have shown us the way for the future vocal pedagogy. Those who are interested in that, and one of the main uh, key points of this. Uh, meeting is uh, how the vocal pedagogy is going to be uh, supported uh, by new technologies uh, for the training. I want to professional singers. And uh, you know, all of us that uh, are today with us, that there is a subjective way to train singers, even in schools, but not only in schools. Conservatories in the university, and they use a lot of uh, qualitative uh, subjects like uh, higher, deeper, and lower, and things like that. So I think uh, that now we have the tools not only to analyze the voice, but also 
to have solutions by the AI machine learnings from the computer. But uh, maybe it's a very nice point to have a discussion because we have created this asthma tool that we are going to show you tomorrow. And uh, they are not they are not so innovative. Uh, I want to say that we have worked a lot on the great language for the thinking that doesn't exist in the bibliography. Uh, but uh, we've also taken account uh, the aesthetic of the thinking voice. And whatever we want to make, real time, visual feedback. But we ask ourselves, and I wanted to ask you, in order to give this knowledge that has been produced the last 40 years to the teacher, and uh, for the future of the digital classroom, which becomes more and more digital, uh, how can we integrate the AI technologies for the comparison of the thinking? For example, if a student thinks that AI uh, system can tell him good for the perfection of the information or time there. Uh, first, this is the question for Excel. What do you think which is the future of machine learning in vocal pedagogy? Uh, so there, I'm winning. <laughs> I don't know. I don't think that the uh, that the uh, you can just train an AI system that replaces the computer. Uh, that that one would need to think about what what would that mean it helps the, the teacher that uh, i mean it, it should provide a target for the uh, for the students to achieve uh, I, i'm a little bit uh, in doubt uh, whether, whether this would, uh, would work so the aesthetic are not really learned i mean you, you just need to, uh, to make a judgment on, on a target not expect that this 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 um, but uh, seriously, uh, I think that one of the difficulties in teaching is uh, the lack of uh, theoretical understanding of how the voice is produced. And we have now good possibilities to include um, teaching of that in the teaching, in the educational singing teaching. Um, also, the synthesis is a wonderful tool in uh, in attracting the attention of the listener, of the teacher, to specific, um, specific um, um, timbral details. And if you could attend, uh, attract the attention to the details, you could also uh, establish and define a terminology. Uh, for instance, uh, the foreman uh, and the resonance uh, is a fascinating debate about uh, what the term really means, uh, and uh, which is not a very fruitful discussion, I think. Uh, and um, I think it's good to uh, maybe know that Foreman was a vocal track resonance in the traditional research, and that is now uh, a peak in the spectrum. That is, that is the difference. And if you know that, you, you feel more comfortable in doing discussion. Also, resonance itself uh, has two meanings in the pedagogical practice. One is what you feel in your head and in your in your in your body. Uh, that is completely perceptual and subjective, and that is entirely separated from the physical um, um, phenomenon of resonance. That is what is happening in, in good systems and in so uh, tidying the, uh, um, the terminology between colleagues and during education, I think it would be a great game 
for local pedagogy. And also you know, acquaintance with what is possible and what works and what, how, how it's controlled in the, um, in the thinking of the voice in, in the studio and in the Malte and uh, Kalaudia, but I would like just to know that the pedagogy is even a separate school. The way so that is very nice. <laughs> and, uh, so I would like to ask you, Malte, what do you think about uh, giving uh, more information to uh, the teachers in the elementary to how they can instruct their decision about? Yeah, okay, very good question. <laughs> so I think uh, when we look at the advantages that digitalization, for example, brings to us, I think there are less and less uh, people going to libraries and certain books to read about things, which is very unfortunate because no colleagues who wrote excellent books. And um, there are not the new approaches. And we have to think about how to bring the information to the teacher and how to make them uh, use it. And one way would be to combine what we just heard about the artificial intelligence. They probably cannot give explanation, but they have used data sets, and we can approximate parameter sets that have not been coverable before. For example, when I started my PhD with simulation of the singing voice, I fell upon a huge problem because the closer I looked, the more parameters I got, and I had no clue what to do with them. And then I I went to Nico Hirsch and I said, Nico, what shall I do? He said, oh, look at it. It's like, like a huge dustbin. You have all your stuff in, in that dustbin. And if you want to have a model, then you just take something from the dustbin, put it somewhere, and it works. They said, who I understand from that? I'm nothing. I said, nothing. I said, oh, oh, that's not very uh, good because I want to write a PhD on the physical modeling of uh, the human voice. I said, yes, you could try. But uh, the parameter solution will not get better by understanding. That is interesting. So you get more and more, but you can do modeling. So you can ask an AI system to play with the parameters. You get a solution, which sounds plausible, but you cannot ask it to get a solution in. And maybe that's not necessary. So if you want to have a specific thing style, you can train a network to do it, to does it, but we do not understand it. So we need both sides. We need to have an understanding how it went there, and we can maybe do the signal. And since the beginning of synthesis, we can go these ways. We can do a perceptual simulation, and we can do a physical simulation, and probably we will never match them. And that's a bit unpleasant, like with the uncertainty theory. So you have some aspects that get closer and closer, but they probably never reach. And for pedagogy, maybe it is just good to have more like the Bilkos model and other models where we can see how things actually work and we can play around with them to increase the understanding. And we need to work on the terminology. It's very important that we talk the right language and that not with, when I had my kids at school, um, then uh, I took them from the kindergarten from the special school and then I said, what did you learn? Oh, I learned today that kids is uh, bright and uh, or dark. And we have, what, what did you learn today? And said, yeah, that's what I learned today. So I said, it's wrong. Yeah, but this is how it is. And that's a bit like in human pedagogy, you can learn something and you feel confident that you learn something that is probably wrong. And I think this is what we could solve. So we could put things right, <laughs> from right to fit, and then uh, make availability of this information in a set of experts that really do something, not only books, but also demonstrations like nice that can be used via YouTube with the prerequisites or by TikTok or by whatever Instagram. So we need to team up with people who are confident in these technologies to bring it to the young. So especially the these teachers, because this is the generation that doesn't use anymore. So we have to bring bring them information such that they can use it. And that's our task now. Unfortunately, we are not experts in this, but we have to do, we have to learn that. Because, uh... We work for the next generation, and uh, we must uh, give them the opportunity to put hands in the classroom and to understand about uh, how to use the binder, uh, the format, the pitch. And for now, they can have time vocal analyzing, for example. And they say, my 
uh, lowest nose, and this is my higher nose. So, like, what I can understand that I don't know, uh, 300 and uh, 800 uh, hertz, and they can understand which is the range of their voice when they are eight. Because after it's going to change. Maybe this understanding, that the awareness of uh, the uh, acoustic uh, characteristics of the singing voice will help them to manage more. There's some point, and one point I should mention also in relation to this with the physical modeling and the understanding of the parameters and uh, the help of uh, teachers. So one idea we had we have currently and uh, that we want to make a project is that you have a neural network that controls the physical model and that you are able to use the What does it mean in my physical model? I can go to the back, and then it takes this Okay, this is very nice idea. Just a moment, I will give just the, the well, la parole <laughs> at Claudia to tell us. Um, and after I, I, we will continue. Sorry, uh, Claudia, can you tell us uh, about your biomedical research on the physical modeling, the browse, etc.? If you have ever a connection with the pedagogue of the singing voice, because uh, it's very important to have their feedback. I know they cannot understand. Uh, for them, this is tiny. This for sure, and uh, this is the reason a new generation of vocal pedagogists that are between us they try to get into the acoustics of the singing voice and use all these new tools, and this is very important. So, what about your experience? Thank you. Um, may I ask the same to the teacher? To the really interested uh, uh, people uh, here, what do you need that uh, technicians uh, like us, uh, uh, by engineers, biomedical engineers, um, expert in the singing voice analysis, what do you really do you really would like to have available as software tool? Which are the main uh, um, aspects that are missing? Because I presented you, uh, of course, uh, some, some results, a uh, little part of the search. And uh, our guess is not really understandable. And then I ask you, can you understand or what would you like us? To develop. So <laughs> I prefer to make a question to the interested people, to the users, and not to explain what can be useful from my point of view, because of course my point of view is my point of view. And vocal pedagogists, uh, yes, indeed, we made some um, some research. And uh, indeed, the, the parameters that we developed were found useful. Uh, it was the um, Gesole School of Music, very close to Firenze, the other uh, big uh, school of uh, music and singing. But in Firenze, they are not so relevant singing schools. And I, as far as I know, uh, and the school's uh, first school and so on, nobody teaches uh, singing in Italy, as far as I know, in the uh, public school. You have to go to specialized school. So indeed, I have no information, enough information about it. Mm 
Thank you. Yes, I was just lovely question because I think it answers what I wanted to do before. So I'm a voice therapist, but of course I work with singers as well. And I think this is the genius of AI. Indeed, in, if we manage to add more parameters and then these parameters can be filtered in or out of a vocal signal, then we can add this to vocal pedagogy and also to voice therapy because at the time being, to do voice therapy or keep singing, you use the sensation, kinesthetic awareness. What are you feeling? If we can match what the child or the adult is feeling with some feedback from artificial intelligence, but with more parameters set in, like the shape of the tongue, the position of the tongue, the, the thickness of the, of the lining inside the, the larynx and the vocal tract. So if we can put a lot more parameters, then that matching will help children in school of what are you feeling, understanding the vocal mechanism and sensation and feedback, and then using that with others as well. As early as possible, yeah, we work in four times. Exciting. I think I just wanted to add up on this. So find the right parameters that can be treated. That's the problem. And there's the universe. And it doesn't look like a simple task because you could end up with an artificial intelligence system that puts the vocal tract upside down or something, which probably couldn't work in, in the number domain, but not in real life. And uh, to find out the range of parameters and where they impact and how they interact, there we need the physics. So we first need the physics, and we call this physically informed model. So they have a bit of physics, and then we let the, the algorithm do the job. But this is a critical part. It can easily go apart, and we can have results that sound good without understanding why. So both can happen, and that's a bit the crucial thing. So we need also the feedback from the algorithms to say, okay, no, no, we cannot play with that. It's possible. Yeah, we can try, but we have no way to communicate. That's important for us to know, so don't touch this parameter, maybe go for something else. Final uh, answer, uh, how to measure tongue position and so on. That means fMRI, uh, it's, it's not possible to do that to all children. And, uh, and so I think this is, at the moment, not a solvable problem, <laughs> absolutely. Until could come, no. but but this was it. To have a, a, a clinician so in, who works with uh, with uh, voices that are disturbed uh, to understand what is uh, that uh, the problem with this voice, and and there we wanted to have the physical model to, uh, to say they are necessary, and they can be trained that. Uh, but the project time we have asked for funding, but we didn't have it. So if we get it, then. And the voice position, 